The Jeep Grand Cherokee 4xe. It's electrified. Boogie, woogie, woogie. So you can boogie, woogie, woogie into the forest. Boogie. Boogie, woogie, woogie through the mud. Or boogie, woogie, woogie to work, where you boogie, woogie, woogie down the hall to your boss's office to tell him you quit. Sure got the boogie. Then you boogie, woogie, woogie to the elevator as he boogie, woogie, woogies after you, begging, please, take me with you. Boogie. The electrified Jeep Grand Cherokee 4xe. Learn more at Jeep.com. Jeep is a registered trademark of FCA US LLC. Hi, I'm Matt Lieb. And I'm Vince Mancini. And this is... Pod yourself a gun. A Sopranos podcast where Vince Mancini and I go through every single episode of The Sopranos and, and talk, talk about, about it. it. And it's the last one, you guys. We did it. We did it. We did it. I was just matching your energy there. I don't know if we were doing a thing or not. No, that was the thing. I was I was trying to be like, you know, every other episode we did you know it's just like hi hey, i'm not there and uh yeah, you, you know this time like i do sound like that i sometimes i listen back and i'm like why am i so dorky um but then uh yeah anyways uh i felt i felt like i don't know like, give some gravity to this one because mm-hmm, it's the last mm-hmm. one this very is the special 80... pod yourself again it's a very special one it's the last it's we've done 86 episodes Whew. that is so, or something like that or 84 i don't know who's counting but uh <laughs> It's, we've done every single episode of The Sopranos, and this is the last one. And it's a very special time for us because, you know, um, I've been asking, I think since day one, for five stars in a review. And um, you guys have been pretty okay at it. But we didn't reach a thousand. And, mm. um, and fuck all y'all. That's what I want to say. Oh, that's good. All right. All you motherfucking! No, I'm just kidding. No, I, I, I really appreciate all the five stars and reviews we have gotten. It is, it's been really sweet, and uh, you know, even though this is the last one, uh, this podcast is is gonna live on. I mean, people who are listening to this right now may have discovered this a hundred years later. You know what I mean? And and by now, maybe the person listening to it is like, "What are you talking about? You guys are the the biggest podcast in the world," and. Uh, and you're the king. You you're both president. You know what I'm saying? I zoned out. You, what are you talking about? I'm talking <laughs> about how you know podcasts like just because it's over doesn't mean people can't listen to it later. You That's know, it's true. not like the, yeah, the no. feed doesn't end. I'm no. saying it's evergreen as and long maybe as they all right. Keep paying the host. We're we'll we could be, be dead. There. It'll be here long after we've mm-hmm. we've dead we've deaded. So. Just want to say thank you, obviously, to uh, all the people who gave five stars in review and also to our big, big donors, $100 donor Charlie Penner, whose um, name should be changed to Charlie Penne because that is Italian for penis mm. and he's got the biggest one in the world, uh, equally as big Huge. as Jason's, who has a big $100 uh, penis mm-hmm. as well. Three and also- figure penis. Yeah, and also someone down, you know, down to the fucking, like, at the fucking buzzer was like, fuck it, $500. We have a $500 patron. That's incredible. Na- isn't that great? Nathan H., oh, my God. I, I fucking love you. I appreciate that people were choosing to invest in us instead of uh, crypto. And uh yes. I think you and made a wise see, decision because this is we, a tangible product that we're putting out here. Exactly. You know? we, we're paying off way more than your apes. I th- feel like people aped into the pod and the slurp juice is plentiful and everyone's everyone's winning. Mm-hmm. Everyone's everyone's winning. I don't want to. I'm not going to talk yet, but what do you get at the five hundred dollar <laughs> level? This is What's take that? it out of the podcast. No one needs to know that I asked this question. But what do you get? <laughs> no, I got keep it in. Know. All right. The fi- the five hundred dollar level, uh, you know, here's the thing. After one hundred dollars, because like the one hundred dollar level, I was uh, originally was like, oh, um, if you do this for three months, Matt will fly over to your hometown and do stand up in the your in the nearest stand up club, and then like that was kind of a joke. But then the pandemic happened, and obviously I couldn't do it. Yep. But now everyone um is calling in that that favor. Yeah, you, you should know start I mean? doing that favor. 
Hurry, man. You're gonna have a kid. I want soon. to. I, I want to. I know Jason, uh, he's over in Arizona, and I need to I need to go and, and visit him. And Nathan H, I don't know where you're at, but wherever you're at, get ready. Because if you're I'm gonna about go to, to Arizona, in, you want to do it right in the summer. That's what everybody says. It's like, the best time to go. Yeah. And I'm I was just gonna say, Nathan H, um I'm I'm packing all my amyl nitrate to get that butthole open for you. <laughs> because I'm you, assuming uh, that if he spent that kind of money on a Sopranos podcast that he likes, that he's probably in New Jersey, which means you'll get to play like maybe you and Jim Brewer can share a bill somewhere at the Stress Factory in New Brunswick. Oh, that would be something. nice. I would love to work with Jim Brewer and just like just kind of watch in awe as yeah. he like does a pigeon movement. It's so and, good. And the piggies laugh <laughs> yeah. for an hour. <laughs> They're like, just this is going- I never realized that this was about getting vaccinated. I thought he was just <laughs> imitating a man with long arms. <laughs> He, he, he does, does a good, a good pigeon. He does a good dinosaur impression. I, Anyways, I like what are his thoughts on viruses? <laughs> um. Anyways, so uh, thank you to, to all those patrons. Uh, we fucking love you. Okay, today, Vince Mancini and I are going to be talking about from season 6B of The Sopranos, episode 9, Made in America. And our guest, you've heard him earlier just like a second ago but also a few other times this is our favorite all-time closer guest this is a guy where like whenever we have a a season finale the dennis eckersley of podcasting Mm -hmm. i'm gonna bring him in here you do me a great honor exactly dude the fucking closer the brian wilson not the beach boy but the pitcher of baseball or podcasting fuck (laughs) You know him, of course, from the wonderful uh, sports blog Defector. Ladies and gentlemen, David Roth is here. Hi. Thanks for Hi. having me. Thanks for comparing me to Dennis Eckersley and, and Brian Wilson, two of the more uh, curiously groomed closers of their respective eras. It means yeah. a lot to me. Yeah, I mean, you know, you got Brian's got that beautiful. Like if you're a relief beard. pitcher and you don't yeah. have uh, some sort of ostentatious grooming choice, like you're really uh-huh. wasting an opportunity there. That's like yeah. your whole job. Eckersley had a cup because he had the mustache, but he also had the like Dorothy Hamill haircut, like the haircut <laughs> that every child has at the age yeah. of three. Yeah. He just like yeah. was out there pitching in the World Series with that. Yeah. I mean, you know, sometimes I feel like you do that to distract the guy, you know, at the plate. Right. You know, because there's a lot of pressure and then you have a guy, you know, looking like a clown. Right. And then you're going like, I can't I can't even I can't even see the ball because I keep looking at this fucking right. Dorothy so Hamill. I keep thinking motherfucker. that's the person that was like the secretary at the elementary school I went to. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're throwing a lot of nasty shit. I had no idea they had breaking pitches like that. Yeah. And that's what that's why we, we wanted to have you back on for a very last episode for that breaking ball, dude. But I'm happy more- to. You know, that that. Br- that breaking down ball, you know yeah. what I mean? Like yeah. break down the... Mm-hmm. Help me out, Vince. Mm. Thanks. <laughs> 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 oh, man. So, David Roth, uh, do you like The Sopranos? Yeah, uh, sure. The TV show? Yep. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I've definitely seen it a few times before. Just different yeah. episodes here and there have been... Um, of course, been on your podcast to talk about it. A That's right. Times mm-hmm. as well. So those are episodes I've seen or that, you know, that I've read the Wikipedia summary of before I came on. Sure, uh, sure, sure, sure. I had not seen some of it. I had, you know, rewatched here and there. This is the first time I've watched this particular episode since it aired. Um, oh, OK, so you know, same you for actually, me. Yeah. You watched it when it aired. Yes. Yeah. So that was my next question for you is this is, of course, the the famous Sopranos ending. And mm-hmm. uh, I think everyone has a different story about what they were doing and what happened. It's kind of like the it's like the 9-11 of our generation, if you think <laughs> yes. about it. And so, like, what what do you remember? What did you do when this ending happened? Uh, You know, the screaming, crying, thrown up sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, I So I had left. I had stopped watching the show for a little while in there. Um, yeah. That basically, like the a lot of the like the episode where Joe Pantoliano kills the stripper and stuff like that. Oh yeah, like, sure. I actually have still never seen that episode. Oh wow! I really? know enough about it. Yeah, I was just kind of sick of it for a while in there. Mm. Um, I had come back like by the time you know as we the last time I was on we talked about the end of season six A. 
Right. And that episode I saw, and then I watched all through 6B, but there must have been a part of a previous, of maybe of 6A, where I was just kind of not mm. uh, feeling it. This, I think, was sort of like affirmed that it did get its feet back under it at the end, but also reminded me of how incredibly fucking tired of making The Sopranos David Chase demonstrably was by the yes. time they got to yeah. this point. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was... I think that, to me, is one of the beautiful things about this episode, which we will get into, um, but is is how much... How self-aware the, you know, the writing is and direction of this episode, where it is very clear that everyone involved is tired of it and <laughs> is like, we got to end this show. This yep. is like we're, this is all is the same thing over and over again, um, which I think is wonderful. But like uh, m- my reaction to that ending was I started hitting my TV. <laughs> yeah. Did anyone else? Yeah. No, I was confused. Was I was like, oh, man, did the feed did the feed yes. go away? Like, was there a power outage at HBO? And I, I think that is like a I think that was the response of a lot of people. I think a lot of people all at the same time went oh fuck the tv just went yeah, out. yeah. and which i think i feel like feels deliberate a hundred percent it's it like his war, his war of the worlds yeah it, it can't not be deliberate because uh, I, i've watched this ending now a few times and every time i'm like there's no one in the world who wouldn't be like ah oh, fuck the cable went out and to end the <laughs> ostensibly the greatest show on television maybe of all time with a prank is <laughs> maybe one of the most bold choices in all of TV. Yeah. In all of art I mean, history. I'll tell yeah. you this. I remember that ending a hell of a lot better than I remember like the game of Thrones ending. Totally. Yeah. Totally. There was no, I felt like the, there was no risks taken with the game of Thrones ending. And there, uh, there was no, I think for most endings of TV shows, a lot of the times, not unlike endings of books, we kind of put a lot of emphasis on like, oh man, it's going to end. Everything's going to tie everything together. We're going to use all of the characters. We're going to fucking tie everything up in a bow. And when we don't get that, we complain. And when we do get that, we complain. Yeah. And no, I mean, like if you compare this to say like the ending of lost, like the ending of lost was probably like worse uh, than the ending of the Sopranos. I mean, oh, all, sure. all endings of series is, are going to be bad because there's no way right. they could not be bad. But right. I feel like Lost was like bad pandering ending where it was like, yeah. hey, high five for watching Lost all this time. Whereas, <laughs> whereas like the ending you of the Sopranos. your Lost points as you <laughs> leave the... <laughs> yeah. yeah, pretty much. Like you get your Lost uh, fucking decoder ring and it says, yeah, thanks for drinking your Lost powder. But... Uh, <laughs> But David Chase was like, he did a bad ending, but he also was like, fuck you. He like fell backwards off the cliff, cliff, flipping you the bird with both hands, which makes me respect it a little more. There's so much of that in this episode, too, where like, and that was the part that I remembered from the the real like backstretch of the show was him just being like, is this what you want? This is what you want, isn't it? You little, (laughs) you you want to slurp it up through a straw? You want to, you want the car to drive over Frank Vincent's head? I bet you do. (laughs) It's so amazing. Every single part of it feels like a fuck you of this episode. Every single part. The fact that it's, uh, you know, a fucking AJ episode, essentially. It's a total AJ episode. It's It's an AJ episode. They ended with an AJ episode. They have that, like, ridiculous prank ending yeah running over frank vincent's head and making it explode was uh, i mean that's excellent no but that to me said like oh you fucking piggies want to see some violence huh oh is that all you want violence i'll show you some (laughs) like even even i think normal like scarface poster dudes like looked at that and they're like, "Geez, damn, yeah, like, dude, that's, that's, a, that's a bit much. <laughs> that's a little crazy." I don't know. That made I felt like that part turned me into a Scarface poster guy. I was like, "Oh, oh yeah, uh, his, his head, one hundred percent, smoosh his head is awesome." Oh, one hundred percent. And we'll we'll get into that as well in the episode. Uh, the importance of the Scarface poster versus not the Scarface poster guy. Um, the 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 two types of Sopranos fans out there that exist. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, the two wolves which mindset you. are you bringing? Are yeah. you bringing the the world is mine <laughs> approach to watching <laughs> Sopranos? Or I mean, you know, it's just like some people love it because it's a show about cool guys and violence, and some people 
are like, no, it's art about feelings and about capitalism mm -hmm. and about the Freud, war in Iraq. Freudian, Freud, Freud. It's about Freud and about and talk Freudian therapy. Freud. Yes. Freud, uh, fruit. Fruit and mental yes. health. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, and you know, those are, those are, I think, two competing warring factions of Sopranos fans. And I think this episode <laughs> ended- Sopranos fandom, like America, uh, mm. is a land of contrasts. Yeah. Wow, dude. Yeah. But What's impressive about it is that by the time you get to the end of it, like the show went on long enough and David Chase is ornery enough that he transparently hated both groups yes! of people <laughs> yes! by the end of it. And so yeah. every single one of them gets a finger in their eye over yeah. the course of 60 lean minutes. Oh, and we got premium TV. We got to talk about it. So, you know what? This is not a podcast. About, well, you know what? This is a podcast about the Sopranos. <laughs> and so <laughs> we must start it, of course, by playing the theme song. Pod. 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 Podcast. Pod. 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 Podcast. All right, ladies and gentlemen and everyone else, today, once again, we're going to be talking about from season 6B of The Sopranos, episode 9, Made in America, which premiered on June 10th, 2007. Vince, for the last time, mm. will you break us off a little piece of that synopsis? I sure will. Tony and his family have to stay in hiding until Phil Leotardo is dealt with. His family mm. doesn't like the lifestyle they've been forced to adopt. AJ and Meadow move on to the next step in their lives. Tony confronts Junior one last time. Absolutely. Mm. All those things happen. Yep. Uh, but what was happening at the time that this episode came out, Vince? Well, that's right, man. I think what you're trying to say is that we cannot evaluate art without <clears throat> acknowledging the cultural context in, with mm -hmm. it, in which it was produced. Yep. And uh, we're going to go back and do that with a little thing that we like to call the uh, Remember When machine. What? Remember Remember when it's the lowest form of conversation. Hell yeah. Uh, I'm going to miss that, dude. Yeah, yeah, we're going all the way back to June 10th, 2007. A uh, mm -hmm. lot, of, lot of headlines out there around this time. <laughs> a lot of ins, a lot of outs, a lot of what have you. A lot of what have you. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> chief among them, uh, Colin Powell went on Meet the Press, and he said that the U.S. should close Guantanamo. Uh, oh hell yeah! Former wow. U.S. Secretary. So is that why they did it? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because he he said we should do that, and everyone was like, "Oh fuck!" Wow, good point. Hell yeah! Former yeah, U.S. So Secretary of State Colin Powell said on Sunday, "The U.S. military prison at Guantanamo Bay for foreign terrorism subjects should be immediately closed, and its inmates moved to the United States." Mm. Uh, quote Guantanamo has become a major major problem in the way the world perceives America and if it were up to me I would close Guantanamo not tomorrow but this afternoon and I would not let any of those people go I would simply move them to the United States and put them into our federal legal system Powell told NBC's meet the press mm. uh, essentially we have shaken the belief the world had in America's justice system by keeping a place like Guantanamo open and creating things like the military commission. We don't need it. And it is causing far more damage than any good we get for it. He added. I don't know about that, dude. I mean, you know, it's uh, fucking, it's nice to have like a spot in Cuba to yeah. chill. It's like yeah. a pied de terre for people that they totally. can disappear into for the rest of their lives. I exactly. wish I spoke French. Cause I never know what that means. Doesn't that mean like a walk on earth? Pied de yeah. terre. I think it's like I a foot get it. on the land, right? So like, what is yeah. that? I don't understand what it what it means in the context of like a cool ass villa. Is that's what it is, right? It's like a little flat. Yeah, it's like if you have if you don't live someplace, but you have an apartment there, so that when you're passing through in the oh. course of your awesome life, that you can yeah. just duck in and you know Dip then your... you're in your little studio in Stockholm, oh, right, right, right above the coffee place you like. Oh, so it's like cool. a vacation home. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. Sorry. Well, this is not a podcast about French terms. <laughs> no, um, this is a podcast about the surprise. Yeah. Whoa, God. No, I'm just kidding. 
Uh, we're kind of light on headlines for this day for some reason. I don't know why, but uh, I, I have a theory. Why? I think What's I know that? why. What's that? Because everyone was like. I don't want to write news right now. I'm trying to watch The Sopranos. That's true. Yeah. We were all watching The Sopranos. I um, think so. In horse news. Uh, Ooh, good. <laughs> we had the first lady horse win the Belmont Stakes in over a century. Yes, queen. A filly named Rags to Riches, a uh, champion <laughs> American thoroughbred. First oh, filly wow. to win it in over a century. Good for That's her. F- good for her. You know what? It, it was her turn. Yeah. I got to yeah. say. Yeah. You know, she leaned in. Mm-hmm. Uh and fucking you know she she fucking did she wear high hoops? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm having fun. Uh, uh, and then I always like to throw in a, a, a slightly random article. Uh, you mean other than the uh, the horse news? Yeah, other than yeah, the, the horse, horse news, news is a recurring segment on yeah, your podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just picked this one because the headline from the New York Post: "Sexed up snoozers on attack." Oh uh, no! Yeah. yeah. Everybody Wait, that was living that... in New York in 2007 remembers the sexed up snoozer uh, we... issue. That was a big one. Yeah. We were all being attacked by the sexed up snoozers. Yeah, they were they were horny. They were mm-hmm. asleep. And sleepy. And they were on the move. <laughs> <laughs> she awoke in the wee hours to find her husband trying to have sex with her. He seemed glassy-eyed, out of it, unaware of what he was doing, the young New Yorker Yo, reported. what? Terrified, mm. she had to fight him off. The next day, he swore he couldn't remember the zombie-like attack. When it happened again, she banished him to the basement. Then she filed for divorce. Fair. Her husband, she learned, su- suffers from sexomnia, an increasingly reported sleep disorder that can not only wreck marriages, but result in unwitting rape, incest, and sexual molestation, experts say. Mm, sounds real. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Not only does it sound real, it sounds like something that deserves it, all the seriousness that New York Post headlines confer to any story that they appear above. Yeah. They're like, this woman was sexually assaulted by her husband when he appeared to be in a drugged up state. And they were like, um, how do we get some alliteration in this? Uh, yeah. Sex up snoozers. Yeah. On, the, on that note, there's this paragraph. Uh, the new report, Sex and Sleep, What Can Go Wrong? By sleep disorder experts at the University of Minnesota Medical School. Mm-hmm. Cites 125 cases of sex in slumberland, from ripping off clothes <laughs> and on. violent masturbation to molesting partners or others nearby. The sex acts often come with loud noises and dirty talk. Okay. I mean, I'm not going to say that it's technically all fake, but just because of Joe Sinclitico's sleep disorder of getting into fights, <laughs> um, he, uh, he, which he talked about on a, uh, on a frat cast, where he, apparently um, he literally like starts punching in his sleep and unfortunately sometimes his there's his someone w- nearby his yeah he has to sleep punched. in a separate room uh, yeah and uh and unless of course, this was all a ploy to get separate rooms which you know smart yeah, yeah. Uh, that's that is an interesting way of doing it but it, it seems i don't know like uh, possible but i mean uh, Look, just, if the, if you, I think I trust the University of Minnesota Medical School uh, more than I do you. So, I mean, I do, too. You're totally right about yeah. that. I'm just saying um, it does seem a little bit like a very neat excuse for marital assault. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's not a it's it's not as fun a story as you'd think that as the post as the seems post. It really, really is. It. It's the really other. not <laughs> yeah. fun. I'm not having yeah. a good time, but no. I very much enjoyed uh, the headline, yeah. and then everything else after that was so much worse than like when you read the headline. I was imagining like um, very horny old people, like kind of like trying to get their fuck on, and they were just yeah. called snoozers because like it's killer like, bees. Yeah, like a killer bee yeah, story, like, like they're gonna come here from right South America. No offense to South America. That's just no where offense the killer to South bees America. We're from of course. Um, top movies in the country. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Oceans 13. Mm. Uh Pirates World's Pirates of the Caribbean the World's End, Knocked Up, Surf's Up, uh Shrek the 3rd and of course uh Hostel Part 2 which we all Oh yeah. remember fondly. It. Um the top the second one. pop song in the country. I'm actually surprised this is uh 15 years old is Umbrella by Rihanna featuring uh Jay-Z. Oh um, man. Yeah. Um the top rock song is still What I've Done. By Lincoln Park, yeah. And so that has been the Remember When machine. Yeah, that that puts us, I think, you know, in the proper context. That's for right. This we were trying to close yeah. Guantanamo, 
Uh, and we were which, trying we know, to stop. All know happened right away yes. after that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it worked out really easily. Um, we were all watching, you know, various uh, sequels: right. the Ocean's Thirteen, mm-hmm. the Pirates World's End. Uh, you know, the Hostel third two. Shrek, Hostel, Hostel two. two, answering yeah. a lot of the questions from Hostel One. Yeah, a lot of yeah, loose ends yeah. had to tie up there. Yeah, I exactly. think they did actually kill off the one guy that survived from Hostel One at the very beginning of Hostel Two, if I remember correctly. That's fun. I like that because you start with a clean slate. Yeah, and then you're like, I never maybe saw it'll go better for everyone this time either around. of those for some reason, which is weird because I really, really liked Cabin Fever. I think that's a great movie. Yeah, but, yeah they're uh, they're not my favorite, but I have somehow seen them both. Uh, they're like they think it was just a matter of like having premium cable and they were yeah. on there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but a lot of like good weird character performances by gross <laughs> character actors in those. The guy, um. I'm forgetting his name. The dude from Suits that looks like the new general manager of the Mets. Got the kind of large lower face type guy. You lost me at the dude from Suits. He's from Suits. You think I I know what Suits Suits is? You might be you're getting it confused with Franklin and Bash. I don't know Mm -hmm. which. uh, Oh, you know what? I was getting it confused with Burn Notice. Yes. I feel like that. That's common. (laughs) That's That's common. That is not anything I was thinking of Bones. I screwed everything up. Yeah. I mean, the crazy thing is people watch all those shows. And yeah. you know what? That's why we're announcing today we are doing a Is burn a notice color? podcast. Mm-hmm. Oh, <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> it is all just burn notice all the time. We're calling it pod notice. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, that's what was happening at the time that this episode came out. We now know all the context. And uh, Vince, you read a really great synopsis. Um, Thank and you. I have. I have a better one, and you know what? Okay. It's like th- this is the last I one. See how it is, and, dude. and um, I mean, you didn't write that synopsis. So I'm not. It's I'm true, not yeah. clowning you, but like, it's it's not as good as this one. So, um, I hope you guys are ready because, man, dude, this this is gonna just blow your mind. Enjoy. Yeah. This reminds me of the song from the episode. Yeah. Yeah. That's the one. (laughs) Hell yeah. We're just the Sopranos. (laughs) The series is coming to a close. Tony and crew and family are hiding everywhere. Just a HBO. <laughs> Number one TV show. <laughs> David Ruff sucks dick and eats the butt. Oh, he eats my. butt and butt. Yeah, dude. And butt and butt. And Sven Sini has a little tiny pee and he likes to have sex with my mom. <laughs> Take that, mom. All right. Well, you can, of course, hear the rest of that song at the very uh, end of the episode. Probably my my greatest my greatest piece of content. Ever. Yeah. No, I, I think you captured the disdain for your fans the I same did. way yeah. that uh, that David, that David chased, chased it. it. Yeah. Yep. I really appreciate you taking the time to say some really rude, nasty things about me personally. It oh, makes yeah. me feel yeah. like I'm a part of the, the team, like I'm a part of the podcast. Myself. You are. You, you, th- that's the thing. When you're on, I'm always like, I got to, I gotta, you know, uh, shout out to uh, my boy David Roth and uh, all the butts he's eating, yeah, you know, thanks. all of the fucking, the cum he guzzles. <laughs> Just wow. like, it's, uh, yeah, that was, and again, that also that also really came through. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, you know, you see an expression like when you hear your family enough times, yeah, it starts to lose its meaning, and then you experience the 
the true meaning of hospitaliano. <laughs> right. <here laughs> <on> the... <laughs> uh, unlimited salad and bread dicks. You know what I'm <laughs> talking about. Anyways, yes, there was a lot of uh, disdain for the audience and for the fans and piggies out there. Um, and you can listen to all of it at the very end. You know, it's a, it's a full song. You'll love it. Um, speaking of disdain for the fans and giving people what they want in a way that is clearly resentful, let's talk about the final episode of The Sopranos. General thoughts. Vince, how did you like this episode? You know, I was curious if I was going to feel differently about this than I did the first time I watched mm-hmm. it, and uh, I really didn't. I feel this basically the same way. I remember this and No Country for Old Men came out around the same time. And I feel basically the same about both of them, which is that it was perfect, except for mm. uh, they had a perfect ending scene and they didn't end on it. Like the To yeah. me, yeah. the shot of Polly sitting out front of Satriel's, uh, right. uh, he's got... He's sunning he, himself. He's sunning yeah. himself and he's trying to shoo away the cat that he's become convinced is like the ghost of christopher like right i right. could not there's i don't think you could come up with a better closing <laughs> shot to the sopranos than that and for yeah. some reason they have like three more scenes after that and uh i just wish that they would have taken that scene and moved it to the end and i would have been okay with it uh i remember thinking that the cut to black i did the same thing you did at the time which was <laughs> like i was confused i thought like maybe my Do the homer simpson banging <laughs> yeah. on your cathode ray TV. oh i was yeah. worried about my the feed of my cable feed cutting out um, i literally then, called my cable provider <laughs> yeah and then yeah, i, I think had the, probably a lot of stories of people doing that. right yes doing. and then yes. when it when i realized that it was deliberate i, I felt like it was sort of a troll i've read the fan theories about like oh yeah uh you know this is just uh this was a metaphor for Tony dying or whatever. And I think there's, yeah. you know, there's some evidence that, uh, you know, that maybe that's what he was going for there. But I think there's more, the more obvious answer is that he was giving you a few, he was giving you evidence in a few different directions. And in the end, just giving you the the middle finger. Like that was a big yep. fuck yeah. you. He had that, David Chase had that interview where he, and this was like recently, I think it was when the, the many saints of Newark came out where he was like, Oh, right. what did you want to see? Do you want, did you need to see like Tony's face down in a bowl of spaghetti? And it's like, no, that's not what anyone wanted, but you could have, you could have like given a little more closure hints that yeah, a it, tiny bit of closure, yeah. even even still left it amb- ambiguous and also given us hints that he had gotten whacked. Uh, but he didn't do that. He did a <clears throat> deliberate like, fuck you. I'm leaving this ambiguous on purpose. Uh, right. And eat shit. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know whether I like that better or whether I would have appreciated, uh, I don't know, some sense of closure. But I, I don't love the ending. Yeah. Uh, at the time, I just want to read a quote from uh, David Chase not too long after um, The Sopranos ending, because I think he was legitimately surprised by um, people being mad about it. And the way that he dealt with that um, was to shame them for for not caring about more important things, Yeah, which, which <laughs> yeah. is in, kind of incredible. It's an AJ he, response. Yeah, it is. Like, Hurricane Katrina is about to happen and you're worried about this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> he straight up said there was a war going on that week and attempted terror attacks in London. But these people were talking about onion rings. And it's like, you're a piece of yeah, shit. You're the one and talking I about onion you. rings. <laughs> right. Also, like, when, yeah, I'm you sorry, brought like, up like, onion rings. <laughs> That really is an AJ response there. Yes. I guess maybe you could give, because there's some, AJ is at operating at incredibly high levels of AJ throughout oh. this episode. Oh, yeah. Like really like, peeking out. And it, I can't tell if you can, I guess you really can't give Chase credit for goofing on himself in that regard. But it's sure. like that response is basically the same thing as AJ quoting Yeats yeah. at the <laughs> Bob, Bobby Bogolari uh, yeah. repast. You want to you have funeral. the same reaction as. Uh, who was it? Bobby's niece, where she's like, "You're all over the place right now." Yeah, what I don't know what you're talking about. about. <laughs> yeah, and and I have a I have a clip of that rant. I I love that rant so much. Uh, then here's a bit of it. Hey, we were discussing dream girls. You see it? You people are fucked. You're living in a dream. You still sit here talking about the fucking Oscars. What rough beast slouches toward Bethlehem to be born? <laughs> huh? 
Yeats. AJ. Yeats? <laughs> the world. Don't you see it? Bush let Al Qaeda escape. Oh. In the mountains. <laughs> then he has us invade some other country. Let's join up. Go kill some fucking terrorists. It's more noble than watching these jack off fantasies on TV of how we're kicking their ass. It's like. America. Oof, what yeah. about it? I mean, this is still where people come to make it. Yep. It's a beautiful idea. Mm -hmm. And then what do they get? Bling? Mm -hmm. Come on for shit they don't need and yeah, can't afford? So you're Snaps. all over the place. I don't know what you're trying to say. <laughs> I fucking love that this is an AJ. It's episode. a perfect, yeah. like, it, that, that poem is a perfect pull because it is. Yes. It, 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 it has inspired like generations of uh depressed guys i mean the, yeah. like if you read that poem like the whole there's really no greater idea in it than man shit's fucked up right now huh yeah, right <laughs> and, and, <laughs> it feels like things are bad and getting worse yeah and yeah. it's and it's Which been is... used so many times since then to express that exact same exact point you know there's like yeah. the joan didion book slouching towards bethlehem and and, and like it has a fig leaf of like high art, but really like what she's saying is, man, shit's pretty fucked up right now. Yeah. And you're yeah, like, yeah, no. dude, it's fucked it up. is about uh, as trite and hackneyed as when people are like, you know, first they came for the blank and I said nothing. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like the same fucking like hack ass response to things is just like it's it's practically a meme at this point yeah, for sad that's the boys. part of it that's the, the i think is really like unfair because i think it's a great poem i think the writing in it is great it's just also one of those things that at this point like when i hear someone yes. quoting it like i'm either thinking of aj or i'm thinking and i don't think it's actually mentioned in that but the the um the christopher walken movie the prophecy where he's like a bad <laughs> angel and he comes down and he rips eric stoltz's heart out and they're i haven't to seen that sounds incredible though. Well, it's just like like a total like 90s apocalypse trash and it's the yeah. same deal where it's like you know really like kind of high flown like Vigo Mortensen plays the devil and all that and there's <laughs> a lot of it's a lot of stuff happening in it and yet at the same time you're kind of like this is like you're it's like a kaiju movie but with angels like it's, right. it's about fights yeah. like yeah. it doesn't need to be a rough beast slouching towards anything in particular what you want is like a super punch yeah and <laughs> and, and there's there's something about like an entire poem that is just a I don't know, a, a very uh, smart and intellectual way to say um, shit sucks, break stuff. Yeah, but I'm, like, I'm upset. I'm depressed right now and shit sucks. I mean, he's yeah, a, you know, yeah. it was a very uh, eloquent way to say that, but that's basically what he's saying. Yeah. yeah. Also, I'll give uh, Chase credit for in all the ways that he insults and taunts his audience that making the last episode of his beloved TV show objectively an AJ episode yes. is one of the funnier meta ways of doing that. Yeah. Like, I know what you guys incredible. want. I mean, incredible. You want fucking Jason Giambi Jr. over here like, yeah. I mean, getting I think, upset in the garage. I think there's some logic to that sh that choice beyond it being like a troll. A troll. Like, it makes yeah. sense yeah. that like You're the end... forward and all that. Well, yeah, the end... The, 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 it makes sense that the last episode would be sort of about the next generation carrying the ideals of Tony and whatever forward and what that's gonna, and hinting at what that might look like but mm -hmm. uh, but AJ is just such like a good character that AJ is the, the character of AJ is such that you could never confuse it uh, for <laughs> confuse him for anything but depressed like you could never yes. you can you cannot find anything like profound or uh, like yeah profound about yeah. AJ like Right. The and, character and I think defies that. what I love about this particular AJ episode and the arc of AJ, um, not just in the episode, but in the entire series, uh, is that this to me feels like on a very meta level, um, the two warring factions of Sopranos fans, um, the dumb guys and the intellectuals. Mm -hmm. Um, you know who the two wolves obviously... that live inside the yes. Sopranos. The two wolves <laughs> that live inside all of us. <laughs> there are there are two wolves, and they're both dumb. And that's what I think I love <laughs> yeah. about this is that like it. This felt to me like you were saying earlier, David. Like like David Chase had grown to hate the other side almost as much as he yeah. hates. The uh, the people who just wanted the blood and the violence and the cool guys stuff. And and I think he almost makes a decision on who is better 
uh, or what is a better way to live your life? And he decides dumb guys. That's yeah. the way to go. And, and, and you see it in the arc of AJ. And so like to get into like AJ's arc, um, we start with uh, we see AJ uh, is, you know, he's at a safe house with the, his mother and um, Tony shows up and AJ is hanging out with Rihanna who's like his his girlfriend um, and, you know, uh, or not his girlfriend at that time, which I, I think I, I'm. I'm a huge fan of the fact that that he's like dating a high schooler (laughs) and 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 who's an elite model. Yeah, who's an elite model. And like his parents are like split between being weirded out by it. And like they're they're mad at him either way is what I'm saying. They're they're like one. She's a high schooler. That's weird, Two, You're not even fucking her like that is (laughs) kind of the the feeling. I got There's also it. like a nice little added element, which I don't think is unique to North Jersey, but does rhyme with my experience growing up there, where they're label conscious in the most like bizarrely open minded sort of way where they're like yeah. an elite model. Like they're never going to leave that out. Like it's right. sort of like my son, who's a doctor, by the way. Yeah. Like it is. Yes. But it's like he could be like he's that's like Conrad Murray's mom bragging. Yeah. Or yeah. Or something like it's just kind of Plus, like. And then they, they ended on him like f- getting to fuck. Uh, and then the car burns, and the whole time I'm watching yes. that, I'm like, is the is the burning exterra like some sort of sexual metaphor here? Like, what are we? Uh, no, like, are we doing? No. Are we doing no. in art? It's it's <laughs> it's the best thing ever because you hear him. You know, I'm not. Uh, you know, I'm not dating her. You know, she's she's in high school. Plus, like, she doesn't even want to be a model anymore. Like, he's getting mad about it. <laughs> she like, wants I to have, do something real. She wants yeah. to make a Yaz record. I I have a I have a, a clip of of that. Part. Wouldn't kick her out of bed for fudge and cookies. Real funny. Which again fine. is a, another beautiful malapropism. Like, yep, yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't kick her out of bed for fudge and cookies. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, nice work. She's a model. She's doing some modeling. Okay. She's Why a are you yelling at high me? school? What? She's quitting modeling anyway. She's tired of being exploited. Like this entire um fucking emo uh pseudo intellectual thing he's got going on you know is is kind of being applied to everything in his life you know his rant at bobby's funeral um or at the wake um you know talking about rihanna and like you know she's just tired of this world exploiting her and then like and then he listens to bob dylan in the car with (laughs) rihanna and a and really I, serious look on his face. Oh, too. and He's, saying like, "Wow, this guy really is just as deep as advertising." <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have. I love. just have that clip. You kept telling me this guy's good. <laughs> it's amazing. It was written so long ago. Yourself, I just love. Wow, you kept telling me Bob Dylan was good. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It wasn't until I have met a model who was in high school that I realized yes. that Bob Dylan was, uh, and and again, just like the the Yates poem, the choice mm-hmm. of Bob Dylan is perfect in the same way because I, I've always, I've I don't know, like I I appreciate mm-hmm. Bob Dylan for what I think he is, which is a musician who is really good at these sort of like scat poems that sure I don't yeah. feel like they had a greater meaning, and it's weird that. Uh, I mean, they they had a meaning. They did have a. I mean, uh, Bob Dylan had a very uh, almost on the nose point with a lot of his songs. You know, I think he was. I feel like he, he was, was the explicitly 60s, political. I feel like he was the '60s version of Kurt Cobain, where uh, okay, like, <laughs> yeah, that's guy. Yeah. Like he did. Like he he gives you just enough um, nuggets of coherence for you to like make something out of it yourself yeah you're like i caught advertising signs that was one of the words he said yeah <laughs> it's, it's That's especially so true. good too because that and so that yates poem plus bob dylan are like absolutely replacement level signifiers of like going through some stuff yeah. but like in an <laughs> yeah. intellectual way yes which is perfect it's like it's not anything that like like he really just found it on the like the middle shelf at the going through some stuff section mm-hmm. at the barnes and noble and the willowbrook mall and like that was right all he needed yeah, and it's like what what I love about it is that like up until this point he has been at least for this season depressed AJ has almost been saying the same kind of incoherent analysis of America as 
I think a lot of people's incoherent analysis of what The Sopranos is about. Mm -hmm. He's almost to me representing guy who thinks Sopranos is super deep. Yeah, and and that, that's the thing. I am that guy. I understand that we are that guy on this podcast, but like he's now come to represent uh like that like me and this podcast entirely at this point like the amount of kind of like cynical mental gymnastics that you know that we do to kind of like make a show that's about titties and meat about like capitalism and american yeah. empire it's like he is doing it in the same i think incoherent way that maybe i do it sometimes Ooh. where i'm just like you know it's a show about america man like it's about like oh all we get is bling and like people still love this place we gotta stop the terrorists but also like why are they you know yeah. <laughs> and it's like war a war on it's a show about the war on terror but like also it's about mental health and <laughs> and then he parks on dry leaves and yep. the car goes on fire and explodes and that ignites his dumb guy brain uh it, it like it it switches where all of a sudden he realizes like oh hell yeah do you guys ever, do you, guys, <laughs> yep. do you ever see idiocracy oh yeah. yeah remember the moment when like they like get they're running out of the car and Dak shepherd and and uh one of the wilsons i forget which one is uh, they're like luke wilson they're, they're running out of the car and then the police start shooting at it and Dax like turns around and it's his car <laughs> And he's just like, oh, yeah. And then they keep shooting at it and explodes. And he's like, hell, yeah. And, and Luke Wilson's like, dude, it's your car. And he just can't stop pointing at it like, oh, it's on fire. That is that is what happened to AJ in this episode. And he almost explains it as much to his therapist, which, which I have a, a clip of. Yeah. When you were inpatient, you said you might try and get a job. I can't now because of the car. <laughs> I need to get a bus schedule. <laughs> Step one. Is, ever since it blew up, I feel like cleansed or something. Because it was a polluter. No. <laughs> I mean, just watching it go. I mean, that huge fireball. And you have no idea. The heat. <laughs> My seat melted. I had been in it just a few seconds before. I mean, he's just like straight up fuck yeah dude yeah the fireball was big big fireball <laughs> hot big fireball explosion how, how did that make you feel excited about how sick it was <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah exactly yeah, really like that, that that's, bit, i love yes. that scene too because there's so many ways like i mean again like while everybody's standing in for everybody else the therapist mm -hmm. being like him being like i felt liberated and the therapist being like by what of the many obvious <laughs> symbolic <laughs> Thing yeah. where you liberated, and he was like, "No, I can get another car. You know, like a different car that I like more. That's different that I can make out with my girlfriend, and she's 16, but she doesn't want yeah. a model anymore. But like that's like, <laughs> exactly. So AJ's dumbness and like the sort of like the fact that he's like authentically moody, but also authentically shallow. Like this mm -hmm. is they actually do pay that off. Yeah, like he winds up as like the person that he probably should be. Yes. Oh, yeah. On a hundred percent. He, he absolutely does. Cause like he is fucking, you know, trying to find himself throughout this whole series. It's all about his identity and it's about everyone's identity in, in a sense, but he is someone who's truly lost because his identity from day one of the show is like cool new, new metal kid who wants to like break stuff and skateboard and like kind of break the rules. And like, as he grows up, he realizes, okay, I'm not a mobster. I'm not an athlete. I'm not a skater. I'm not a criminal. I'm not anything. Like, what am I? Am I a club owner? I don't know. And then eventually he's just like, I'm a sad guy who wants to kill himself. And then his parents are like, what if you were a movie producer? And he's like, yeah, right. yeah what if I was a movie producer? Exactly. <laughs> what if you had the one job that required the least of you, but also you had a car? Yeah. And it was girls around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. They get you him as come up with dumb points about a script that you sort of half read. And I love that they get him a job as like literally he's uh, some sort of a development executive, which is 
the greatest like Hollywood insider euphemism for like when you're like, oh, I'm a development person. You know, it's always just like it's a step above being an assistant. But it's like it sounds like you're doing work. You it's know what like I mean? It's like the greatest job because, I mean, essentially he was giving his script notes about America earlier. Mm -hmm. So you can yes. just apply that to like someone's script where he's trying to give notes and the writers. Just yes. Like, I don't know, man. You're kind of all over the place. You're asking yeah. me to do like five contra completely contradictory things here. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And and it's almost like a, it's a side of nepotism that uh, I never really considered it before. Like I'm always uh, nepotism or like privilege where it's like, usually my thought is when someone, you know, is a rich guy who gets into the uh, entertainment industry or someone who's like families in it and they get in it. My thought is usually fuck those guys, man. Like they fucking, they're, they're not working for these opportunities. But then I like look at AJ's side of it and it's like the, his parents are like, we're trying to get him not to kill himself in <laughs> Iraq or, you know, trying to get him not to, like, be, you know, suicidal or, like, become a drug addict. There's nothing else we can do to stop him from this trajectory other than to flex some privilege and get him a job in the yeah. entertainment industry. Throw a, a, like, a do-nothing job at him that will enable him to, like, be comfortable and have the little treats that he likes. Yes, and, he, yeah. the treats and the plaque that says, this is your identity, this is your job, this is a, a, a cool car so people know you're cool. Yeah. You can pick up your high school girlfriend and everyone knows you're cool. All he needs and, is, like, a series of empty signifiers to be happy. Yes, yep. yes. And, and so, you know, I never considered that side of, like, all the people in Hollywood that I resent who like have family in the industry or like have family who's very wealthy. So they were able to work their way up in this industry. And I never considered that if it wasn't for these jobs that they were taking up, they would be dead and in the street somewhere <laughs> or like cannon fodder in Iraq. Yeah. So, you know, I feel I, I you know, uh, point taken, David Chase. <laughs> Point taken, but uh, it is it is a great arc for AJ to like kind of finally come around to the person that he's always been, which is like a fail son, yeah. and and they're allowing him to do that without humiliating him, which I like too. You yeah, know what like, I mean? David Chase very much doesn't showing. Him. Sorry, I'm uh, finish what you're saying. No, oh no, that, that's it. I was just like David Chase doesn't humiliate him. He um. He gives him, I think, kind of a proper context and says, like, it's so, okay. yeah, he's dumb and he's not competent. And that's okay. Look, he's happier now. He's he saw cool big fireball. Hot girlfriend, <laughs> big fireball. That that is you could call that person dumb, but that intellectual person is like miserable. So yeah. who's leading a better life? And I, and he I love have I love the that. framework, none of the critique, like none of the things that he's saying, if you take them, none of them are especially deep, but all of like his like speed run of kind of like gloomy 2007 politics points at yes. the Bobby Bacala, or Bob, Bobby Bacala's <laughs> wake, wake, none of those are wrong, but right. the girl is right. Like he is all over the fucking place. It's just kind of, it's like a, like a King's Things column, you know, yes. like, just like <laughs> ellipses separating observations, like soup yeah. is a treat that can't be beat on a cold day, you know, yeah. but it's all about like the, you know, whatever national loss of identity and mm -hmm. uh, crisis of meaning and all that. Yes. Yes. But I, like, that is how it resolves like it is like this is basically how most people deal with that they don't have he doesn't have a framework for a critique there's nothing around him in the culture he lives in that would help him take those disparate but not incorrect points and have them cohere into an actual worldview right like that's not an option there like you're sitting at a table with a bunch of children and paulie walnuts with his pants unzipped going did i eat <laughs> you know like so i love but also, yeah, so this is probably the best case scenario for him i think, I think right. so too and and it's the, it's the scenario in that kind of i don't know it's like the outcome is just better for him because you know like he's not a bad guy He's just kind of dumb and incompetent. And that is he's he's absolutely just a fucking product of the environment that he grew up in and not in the same like, I don't know, sympathetic way that like someone who grew up in the hood or in the ghetto or like whatever, like someone who grew up poor is like a, a product. It's like he's a product of like this, like this small middle class, like petite bourgeoisie <laughs> now i'm starting to talk like him but you know what i mean like it's like he's 
that's just who he is, man. It's like yeah. I look at Chet he's, Hanks and I go, that's who he is, and I respect right. it. Yeah, well, he's a uh, he's a victim, but like you can't see him as a victim because he's too like dumb, privileged, and uns- unsympathetic, and that's right. generally the case. Like, yes, you know, you don't have to pity people to recognize that they're uh, like products of their upbringing, and yeah, uh, that's sort of the case with him. Right, and yeah. You can see that as like both of the kids in this episode do sort of like, I mean, Meadow was always obviously going to have an easier time of it because she's like, can read at grade level and <laughs> seems to be able to like function socially in a way that AJ can She can can't. succeed in the meritocracy. But they're, oh, both, yes. it, they're both achieving a certain type of exit velocity, which I guess yes. in some ways you could say is like a success for yes. the soprano parents and that she's going to be like, she's doing her brief stint in the world of like, uh, Law. you know, public service stuff, but then eventually it's just going to become like a progressively richer and mm-hmm. progressively less liberal liberal. Of course, and you know, but it's also like out of this thing of ours. Yeah, and yeah, then yeah, yeah. I was laughing at that. I had forgotten that like it's Patsy Parisi's son that she winds up with, and so yeah. the idea of like. Patsy Parisi Jr. being upgraded to like Patrick Parisi, like maybe there's no K on, you know, there. Yeah. It's like, again, another perfect little like sort of Sopranos joke, the way that all these people sort of go through this car wash and mm-hmm. emerge on the other end as like normal, unreflective suburban people, I mean, despite yes, yeah. all the shit that their parents went through. They're both taking their place in the patronage system in one way yeah. or another. Sure. Yeah. And, and, you know, as is their, uh, blood, as right. is their birth. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, but yeah, it is, uh, it is kind of wonderful to see. Uh, I, I agree with you, Vince, that it's like, there is, I think a legitimate reason for it to be an AJ episode to close it out. Um, but I, I am firmly of the belief that it is mostly a troll. And I and I think that of this entire episode and uh, where I disagree with you is that upon rewatch, I loved this episode. Mm. Oh, so I, do I. I just don't particularly enjoy the ending. Like, oh, OK. Yeah. OK. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think I upon rewatch, I, I now enjoy the ending and I think I enjoy it because I I understand the I think just absolute hatred that David Chase has. Yeah. yeah, but there is so much good closure in the Polly storyline. I mean, it, yeah. like it's the perfect uh things wrapping up but always staying the same uh, at the yeah. same time. Like the fact that Polly has finally gotten offered uh the capo job that he's always wanted uh, mm-hmm. but is now uh wondering whether he should take it. And then uh, we we talked about this before on the Frogcast in terms of uh uh Inside Lewin Davis, which is probably my my favorite movie, and uh, like the yeah. best part is that there's like this uh, magical cat in it. And Brett's quote was like, "Every movie and every TV show should have a magical cat," uh, right? Which I hundred percent agree with. And like, I <laughs> and watching this, I was like, "God damn, did the Sopranos like invent the magical cat?" Because uh, it's just like a perfect. <laughs> No, Hocus Pocus did, dude. Like, there's this. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I because I I don't love you know like magical realism or like symbolism, sure. but I like when there is that magical cat element where there's this there's this element of it that has a little bit of the supernatural in it and has a little bit of just like sort of cosmic ambiguity to it. Totally. And it, it always makes everything like a little bit better. Uh, and that's why I really love this whole storyline because it's uh, like yeah. the, the the Christopher Cat gives Polly the fuel to be like the most Polly that he could ever be, which is sure that he's he's like holding on to uh, the old world superstitions for, yes. for some reason, even while <laughs> being it. even like while being this thoroughly like modern guy absolutely who, yeah. I, doesn't want to work too hard. I, I have, think that you can give the episode a lot of credit for how much Chase had figured out what all of these characters were about and how to make them funny. Yeah. Yes. So like Paulie, like like going like Madone to a cat that's like standing on the <laughs> table in front of him is like it's perfect. Like that's he's achieved his like final form. That's yeah. where he should be. Yes. Ditto for I was thinking that there was one. I mean, it's like a pretty obvious little bit of sitcom writing, which as I think mm. Vince pointed out on. The distraction with us when we were talking about many scenes of Newark that like Chase is still like 
such a veteran TV writer Mm -hmm. that there's a lot of like moves from generations past where she was, where Janice is talking, this is her last scene with Tony. Yes. And she's up there and she's like, I think I've, you know, managed to exercise all of Mm -hmm. the, you know, the influence of my mother. Not that anybody ever gives me any credit for it or that I ever get thanked at all by anybody. I I have that clip. I have that clip. It's it's perfect, but it's just. I'm a good mother. I put Ma and all her warp shit behind me. Oh, good. I get any oh, thanks for it. <laughs> so good. <laughs> but that is, so that is like a Roseanne gag. Yes. That is a sitcom yes. gag with a setup and a punchline. Mm-hmm. And it's it's killer. Like I laughed watching yes. it by myself, having seen it before. But again, it's like sort of Chase ticking all the boxes, but he's like so in command of the gags that would adhere to these characters that he's created that like that one and especially the Polly one both really were like, yeah. I mean, they weren't loving because it's like he's so fucking over all of these people, you know? Yes. Yeah. But there was like an element of like at least some sort of affection or at least of like deep knowledge in sure. there that I made mean, it kind of fun to watch. I have the stuff with the cat. Let me just play that clip because it is it's just one of my fucking favorites. He was at the safe house. We brought him over. Get him the fuck out. <laughs> he's a snake with fur. You old Italians will tell you. You can't even put him around the baby. They suck the breath right out. Well, oh, you're the only baby here, so we're ahead of the game. You want to be wearing this fucking pelt on your head? I said get rid of him. Leave him. He's a good guy. I just, I love, number one, I love that Tony loves cats. Like, and you you know that he loves cats because he called him a good guy. You know what I mean? Yeah. One of ours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's he's a friend of ours. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just, his fear of this cat is just so fucking funny and like later that character walden is telling him that his mother used to have a cat who would either stand in the corner of the house staring out or stand in the corner of the house staring in (laughs) and he like polly is like we have to murder this cat (laughs) like (laughs) like, as if that's witchcraft (laughs) and not and not a rat in the wall or some shit um now let's I you know I think we should also get into um Carmela a little bit. Uh she I think has a really easily wrapped up storyline in here. Um I do love that you know like they're so AJ's car burns uh and then they're like they're like grasping at straws to figure out why this is AJ's fault even though it's kind of like yeah. it's like a weird fluke. It's one of the weird it's one of the few things that's happened to AJ that isn't a thousand percent his fault this one you're kind of like well i don't know i guess he parked on some leaves and that made the car explode that doesn't really feel super like his fault but it is unlike most of the other things that have happened to him it's something that theoretically could happen to someone else yeah yeah and she does the thing where she's like what if there was children in those leaves?" oh that's my fucking favorite (laughs) i have that i have that clip i didn't see the leaves you can grill fucking steaks on that converter (laughs) i told you if there was children playing in those leaves, you'd have run them over. I guess. Are you going to get cute now? <laughs> I was just answering her question. Dad, he wasn't being funny. You mind your own goddamn business. Unless you want some of this too. Mr. Fatmouth. Yeah, Mr. Fatmouth. <laughs> yes, the idea that she would be like, hey, you know, it's almost like she wanted to go with like, if everyone else is jumping off a bridge, you jump off a bridge. And instead it was like, if children had been there, yeah. you would have killed them. And yeah. he he truly is correct to be flummoxed by whatever the fuck she's talking about. In this episode where Carmela is just kind of like absolutely reaching the edge of like Carmela things that you like where she sees Hunter and Hunter's doing fine. Yes. I in love Meadow's that. room. And she was like all prepared to be like, so have you stopped being fucked up so far? Because that would yes. be, you should try not doing drugs. They make you skin bad. And instead she's like, I'm flourishing. I'm in med school. Like everything's oh, uh, good. And she's got nothing. She can't say anything back. She's, she's just, like legitimately mad about it. Like yeah. you can, you can see that she is, She's not happy for her. And it's crazy because like, like, 
I mean, you can't even fake it. It's like she has something with like her daughter not being a, in med school that is like killing her. Yeah, and, I, also, um, I feel like uh, David Chase's daughter who plays Hunter. I feel like she convinced her dad. She was like, you gave me one cameo when I was like 12 and like dead smack in the middle of my awkward phase. Yes. What if you yes. gave me like one more cameo to show people that I look normal now and I <laughs> right. grown into like a beautiful woman or whatever? Yeah, yeah. I, I feel like that was a fair thing to do was yeah. to like put her back in and just be like, see, she's not like she's past puberty now. So, yeah, yeah. you know, she looks great. Um, But uh, yeah, it is like uh, it's a great scene. I have a little bit of that. Miss Hunter, long time no see. How are you, Mrs. Soprano? Oh, my God. When was it? Uh, it was right around when you quit college. You're being kind. I was kicked out for partying and drunk driving. Well, I didn't want to say, but, uh, well, that was always you. She's not being kind. No. Nothing she just said is being kind. Yeah. <laughs> it's like she br the, brought up a bad time in my life in the yes. first time you've seen, within the first 30 seconds of when you've seen me for the first time in years. Yeah. And, and like the idea that I haven't seen you since this horrible thing and then being like, well, that was always you. A yep. terrible person. <laughs> right. She's so cunty. Uh, but then Hunter gets back at her. So what are you up to now? I'm in my second year of med school. Oh. Yeah, I completed undergrad at Purchase. Got my act together. Yes. Uh, they're going to be here, Meadow. <laughs> just completely. Not, no congrats or nothing. Yeah. Just yes. Well, this is special. Yeah, this is of no interest to me anymore. Do you have oh. anything like I don't know? Do you have gas or anything? Have you had any bad experiences recently? Do you have like any I, fodder for my petty grievances? Yeah, it is which so I for some weird. reason have against you because you're my daughter's friend, and I'm yes. just like swinging wildly at the entire world. The idea that she would be competitive for her daughter in that sense, where she's just like, at least you beat that bitch Hunter. And it's like, <laughs> why do you hate Hunter? I don't understand it. But it, I, I do feel like it is a great way of like kind of not wrapping Carm's character, but kind of, um, you know, uh, just that continued insight into her absolute like petty. Yeah, fucking... exposing her as just as venal and petty as every other character on the yes. show. Because yeah. like there was periods where, you know, Carmela seemed like the, the voice of reason or like totally the audience stand in or whatever. And mm -hmm. uh, David Chase through this his whole season is going to great lengths to be like, no, there is no voice of reason in this. world. Yes. There yes. Is no... She's as unhappy and as any of them and un more unappeasable than any of them. And that is just how that is. Yeah. Like yeah. Her in the in the safe house being like, I noticed that Oda in the air. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Just kind of like, well, it's a safe house. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that, yeah. <laughs> so that a man this is a, a place to be where you won't die. Yeah. So like, the alternative is you can be in your own house and then a man with one of those like really smooth leather jackets like shoots you. <laughs> yeah. You just get murdered by a fat dude in silk socks. Yep. Like, cool. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it is, uh, it's great. And you know, at the end it's just her, um, going up to Tony while he's raking leaves and looking out and being like, the consensus is Holston's, which I love the idea <laughs> that like it is, it's this you know, beautiful moment in, that is interrupted with her being like, everyone is, well, I've taken a poll of the Sopranos family and it's diner <laughs> food tonight. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's lovely. Have but, you ever um, eaten at Holston's, David? Is that a real place? It is a real place. It's mm -hmm. in Bloomfield. Um, I've been by it, but I haven't been there. Mm -hmm. The place that I liked to go in Bloomfield, and I remember my dad taking me there once when I flew back from college on a red eye, was a place called the Shortstop Diner, where they would serve you eggs and bacon in, like, the little cast iron skillet they mm -hmm. made oh, it in. yes. Good shit. Um, yeah. not what you should eat if you've been up all night. Like and on an airplane, but it was you <laughs> sure. know beyond the the repercussions were what they were. Uh, I very much enjoyed that. Holston's is, I believe, is still open, um, and it really is old. I mean, I think it it maybe is a hundred years old. It's like an old ice cream fountain place, yeah. soda fountain type thing. But no, I've not been there. Like, there's the way that New Jersey works, or at least that part of New Jersey is that like we had our own sort of version of it that was less good, but every town kind of does or like any town above a certain size. Sure. So you wouldn't go to Holston's because it's like 25 minutes in the car. If you could go to like Baumgart's and it's like five minutes in the car, right, you right. just go there. Um, yeah. But you should have, I mean, I would like to go to Holston's. I don't know if it's still doing tourist biz off this, but I know for a long time they, they really were. Oh, I it can makes, imagine. It makes me think of Bruce Willis, who I guess grew up in Jersey somewhere, mm -hmm. where I listened to that podcast where he like tried to take over 
a whole town uh, in Idaho. And like one of the first things he did was like bankroll, uh, you know, an old school diner like yeah. this where, you know, he was spending all his money to like operate this diner at a loss solely so that when he came in to this town in Idaho to like go skiing or do whatever, like he, he would could have get fucking disco fries. Yeah. Like, on he, demand. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. He could, he could have his diner food, but it also had like weird, you know, Hollywood shit, uh, that you wouldn't be able to get at a diner. Cause he was still sure. a famous person. Yeah, yeah I want a fancy Johnny Rocket. Yeah. Can you yeah. make that? Yeah. It's like a 50s diner, but it has like an extensive tartar program. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I was like, why is there a sushi menu? This is weird. <laughs> it's, it's just yeah. like I used to have it when I was growing up in Neptune Township. Yeah. Dude, like, <laughs> you go. Every time I go to uh, Sundance, like I'll go, we usually st- we usually stay in this condo and it's next to the big supermarket in Park City. Mm-hmm. And during Sundance, every time you go in there, there's at least ten people like sitting down at the tables eating like the fucking uh, supermarket sushi at oh the at, at the, <laughs> at the price store. chopper. And it's like, I don't know, like I love sushi too, but like when I go to fucking ski towns like it's not my first instinct to get yeah <laughs> it's just really it's a that very is incredible that you're so dedicated to the hollywood lifestyle that like wherever you are if you see yeah. sushi you're like yes. i should have that yeah it's no got you, a lot of the good oils you have it. to have the thing that you're used to having no matter where you are and you demand yep. it it's great <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Just it's a bunch of for- AJs. It's a bunch of development executive AJs that yes. are in there eating yeah. fucking sushi. I have to have my mom's cooking. It might mess with my blood chemistry. It's the same <laughs> shit. I do like it's- the idea of everyone at Sundance, like the AJs of Sundance, but they're all eating just manicotti at the like Whole yeah. Foods. <laughs> <laughs> a bunch of cheese blooping at the end. They're like, oh, just yeah. At the- just at like a really fancy theater watching a screening of some art movie with a whole fucking bowl of manicotti <laughs> and just like sl- Slurp in it. Oh my god! It's like it's my mom's. Uh, He's getting in a dispute because you're trying to sneak Cavatelli into crimes of the future. <laughs> I'm here for work. Yeah. Well, why does um you can't bring a backpack in here and it is dripping oil? <laughs> it's obviously full of gravy, sir. Yeah. Why do you have gravy in that bag? Um. But yeah, so to, to get into um, uh, Tony and the mafia storyline of this episode, um, we open the opening scene of this is, of course, Tony waking up in the safe house um, because that's been the the theme has been of the season. I think is every opening shot has been Tony waking up from a bed. Um, I mean, this one I felt like was very art. clearly like coffin imagery. Like, yeah. He's, yes. He's on his back and he's got a little white pillow under his head and he's yeah. uh, you know, center framed. Like he looks very much like he's at a wake. And I think I, I'm assuming that was part of the gag with the opening shot of the of the episode. Yeah. Yeah. They're doing they're doing a little bit of uh, symbolism, a little bit of art um, and uh, kind of a joke. And uh, so like. Next, we see him immediately. It cuts to him being in that in that van with Polly, listening to the same doo music they've been listening to since they were kids, <laughs> um, and just kind of waiting for the FBI agent um, to show up. Who um, it, it seems like this is the the big payoff for all of this, like the Arabs at the Bing and all that stuff. We, we finally is, humanize the FBI agent for some reason, yeah. and the way to yeah. humanize him is like, yeah, he's got a pain uh, in the ass wife and a gumar yeah. too. Yeah, yep. he's got a bitch wife. <laughs> um, and the, yeah, so we have... I have we're not that. so different, you and I. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're, we're both tired of these broads. <laughs> um, all right, I have a clip of that. Hey, probably another hour. Just leave it out, all right? I'll, I'll heat it up. What? Then don't leave it out. <laughs> what do you want me to say? <laughs> <laughs> he just hangs up and he's just like my wife <laughs> just like, <laughs> it, is, uh, it is great and having that moment in front of Tony where he's like yeah, anyways um, <laughs> if you could tell me where the bad man is uh, <laughs> that would be very helpful um, so it's yeah it's clear Tony is just tr- trying to get some information on the whereabouts of Phil Leotardo and Agent Harris is telling him that he is overreaching so then we have uh, Tony Soprano. He is uh, he's back at the safe house. Envelopes are light. He feeds a stray cat. 
and he won't come visit Syl in the hospital and he goes upstairs with his big machine gun. Um, <laughs> then next we have, uh, so Butchie gets a call from Philly and I feel he's just mad that they didn't kill Tony earlier and he's trying to suggest, um, Butchie doesn't say it, but he's trying to suggest that they just don't go through with this war. Yeah. Everybody's sick peace. of Phil's shit at this point. Yeah. Not yeah. surprisingly. And I love that he's walking through this like area of um, Little Italy, and um, you know he's taking this phone call with Phil, and he walks like one block, and he's just in Chinatown. Yeah, and he and he looks around, and he's like, "Oh, there's too many Chinese. <laughs> oh, this is not good. This is not. What am I supposed to do now? There's Chinese everywhere." And it's like, have you never been to Chinatown? <laughs> like, how long has he been hanging out at Little Italy and just right. being like, it used to go on for ages. <laughs> It's now a, you go down Mott Street, you can't get pizza no more. You, yeah, That's you, been true since 1996. <laughs> <laughs> right? Exactly. Um, and uh, yeah, so like Tony uh, visits Janice and she's doing... It's like, oh, I can't believe these Chinese are taking over Little Italy. Oh, where do you live? <laughs> I live out in the mansion up in North Jersey. Yeah. Right? Like, oh yeah, I don't know why yeah. that happened. It's so weird. Yeah. It's not like it used to be when yeah. I lived there. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, we have Tony visiting Janice and we kind of, uh, we wrap a bow on that storyline with her basically saying, I don't care what Bobby Jr. does, but I'm keeping his sister so that my little girl has an older sister, which, um, truly twisted shit. <laughs> yep. Um, and, uh, you know, just makes me love her all the more because she's gonna, you know, that she's still alive after this <laughs> and she is just she's responsible for emotional damage yeah like untold a a free floating trauma event moving through the world (laughs) yes just constant like literally a a natural disaster yep just at all points in her life for anyone she is uh is who surrounds her (laughs) long may she wave (laughs) (laughs) um tony gets a call from agent harris and uh agent harris tells him he's like hey Philly is hiding out in o- Oyster Bay, Long Island. Uh, he got his info from his Brooklyn office. It's such connection. a funny scene. Like they had to crowbar the fact that Agent Harris had a unsatisfying sexual experience with a colleague in there for some reason. Yeah, he has a Gumar who works at the Brooklyn office. But she's like mad at him. Like they had, they had bad. Se- like they, it's heavily implied that the sex they just had was unfulfilling oh, in that- some way. I thought she was mad because she knew that he was passing information yes. to his mob buddy. Oh, yes. I, I mean, yeah, sure. I don't know. It felt there was a there was a vibe that like they were not happy with each other there, and I guess we could speculate as to why that is. But yeah, yeah. I like that you immediately went to like his dick game's atrocious well i mean like his the way dick that... game is definitely atrocious i'm we sure know this. i mean it's a like cop. inherent have... to the character yeah. if you have great sex i don't think the first thing you do afterwards is think oh i gotta call my mafia buddy and tell him that, right uh, yeah. this other guy yeah. needs to get a cab stands for all cops are bonerless <laughs> um so <laughs> Did you know that yearly Medicaid renewals will start again soon? This means millions of people who were enrolled in Medicaid during the pandemic may no longer be eligible for coverage. If this may impact you, the good news is you have options. Anthem Blue Cross and Blue Shield can help answer your questions so you can find an affordable health plan for you and your family. We want you to feel confident you're covered. Click to learn more. Policy exclusions and limitations apply. Anthem Blue Cross and Blue Shield is the trade name of Community Insurance Company. AT&T Fiber presents A Straightforward Moment. Your wine? Thanks. I'll pretend I know what I'm doing before saying it's good. And I'll pretend I don't know you're pretending. Are you a gagillionaire? Yeah, I have AT&T Fiber. The straightforward pricing has inspired me to be more straightforward. Me too. Ugh, this wine. I'll fetch you a better one. Straightforward is better. No equipment fees, no data caps, no price increase at 12 months. Live like a gagillionaire with AT&T Fiber. Limited availability in select areas. Visit att.com slash hypergig for details. Science proves quality sleep is vital to your mental, emotional, and physical health. The Sleep Number 360 Smart Bed senses your movements and automatically adjusts to help keep you both effortlessly comfortable. And it's temperature balancing, so you stay cool. So you're at your best for yourself and those you care about most. Life-changing sleep, only from Sleep Number. It's our ultimate Sleep Number event. Save 50% on the Sleep Number 360 Limited Edition Smart Bed, plus special financing. Ends Monday. To learn more, go to sleepnumber.com. Special financing subject to credit approval. Minimum monthly payments required. See store for details. 
but yeah, uh, he, I assume that was his connection at the Brooklyn office that he has been alluding to this whole time. And, uh, you know, it's their way of being like, Hey, FBI oh, you think people the girl are the, his, re- it, you, the, you think the Gumar was his, uh, yeah, that oh, was okay. his, she got a badge and everything. Yeah. She has a badge. Yeah, but why and, would, I don't know. I thought, I thought when he, his connection was like someone in the muff, I don't know. No, no, no. It was someone who works at the Brooklyn office okay. who, okay. you know, keeps more tabs so you than think he, he does. Was, he was pumping her for information? He was pumping nice. her for information. Okay. You I know see what, what you did there. Yeah. Hey, yeah. that was cool. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so I, I think it's like, you know, he's got a Gumar. The The real gangster is uh, the FBI as well, I guess. Yes. Um, so, uh, yeah. So then we have the sit down. Tony talks to Butchie. They come to terms. Um, a bunch of shit. It's almost like watching it. The, even in the edit, they're like, "Who cares? Who cares? Who cares? Who cares?" <laughs> yada yeah, yada yada yada. Everything's good. And then immediately cut to the everyone's moving back inside their <laughs> homes. Like war over. It was the quickest way of saying. Anyways, the war ends, and now um, Butchie's basically said, "I'm not going to tell you where t- where Philly is, but you do what you got to do." Which is um, too bad for Phil. Yeah, um, I don't think he survives the in, the thing that happens to him in Long Island. I I it's don't strongly implied that he does not survive it. It's implied, but who really knows, dude? You don't know. You know that it cuts to black, and yeah. what by, what I mean is it cuts to black people, black people who throwing are, up because we're throwing just up over his head. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we got to talk about this, this incredible death scene, um, with, uh, Phil Leotardo, uh, cause throughout the rest of the episode, I mean, this is 15 minutes in and the fucking, the war is over and it's just like every 10 minutes, it's a scene of people, mobsters looking, uh, at different gas stations for the payphone where in Oyster Bay, where Philly is making his phone calls. And so, uh, towards the end of the episode, we finally see Phil. Um, and he has his wonderful goodbye, which is just, it also, I, lo- so I feel yes. like there's also an element there of, uh, boomer, like nostalgia where it's like, can you believe we don't even have pay phones at the gas station anymore? Yeah. Everybody's yeah, walking yeah, around yeah. buried in their cell phones. And so like Philly Leotardo gets undone by the fact that nobody uses pay phones anymore. There's only like right. three yeah. pay phones. Yeah, too that's old right. School for his own good. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, they would have had to like monitor every single gas station with a, a payphone in the area. But there's like, no, there's only two of those anymore. Cause, you know, fucking society these days. <laughs> you can't, you know, got a, a Facebook. Um, <laughs> but, anyways, the, the Phil scene is just incredible. And I have a, I have a clip. Bye bye. Wave bye bye, Grandpa. <laughs> bye bye, Papa. <laughs> Bye-bye. 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 I got to make a phone call. I'll meet you at the drugstore. I should get a 60-day supply of the planet. Again, I the feel man? like you could watch this. Like you could just watch the show with the video off, and like the uh, the sound editing is good enough that you understand what's happening in any given yeah. moment. Oh, absolutely! It's the most translatable like TV show to podcast I think that exists. I mean, just that head being yeah. crunched, hardcore foley art. That's like <laughs> yeah. They had to put a like a watermelon in the mouth of a hippopotamus. <laughs> they, had, they had to buy a hippo. <laughs> I, but, what I love too is like visually the detail of like the little like so it cuts to a group of black kids hanging out um and like they 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 see the head you know being crushed and basically their role is what it's always been on the sopranos for the most part for any black character is to be like damn yeah, and that then, is whack 
Yeah, ex- <laughs> exactly. And so I almost feel like they wrapped up that storyline too. Like black characters on the Sopranos. It is all wrapped up like, in a bow. That is a wrap for all members <laughs> of your race. Yeah, exactly. On the show, it's like they never never made it to that other level where they like were where they got a single black writer or producer to be in yeah. there to be like, hey, maybe make us with substantive. But uh, I also love the guy who says, oh, shit, he's got like little arms. Um, like, And I don't know if it, it's a disability or if it was the angle of the camera, but it's just such a, it's like a weird sight gag that they do. And it, like for maybe one of the most gratuitously violent deaths in the show where it's like, I mean, there's one thing to shoot a guy, but you're going to have his head be run over by an SUV and splatter like a fucking grape and yeah. have a little have a guy who's got uh, strange arms or malformed I mean, arms. They're doing being the, like, oh, shit. They're doing the thing that, uh, you know, classic movie villain death scene where it's like once the once the audience grows to hate a villain at a certain level, we know that like a simple death just yes, won't it do. won't do. Like you, you yeah. have to like impale him on something, or you yeah. know, you have yeah. to desecrate the corpse. You can't just kill him. And uh, right, and I really enjoyed it. Oh, no, yeah, me maybe too. That makes I love me it. a piggy, but I was like, ah, oh, finally they whacked fucking Philly. Yeah, I mean, he was, he was yeah. shit. just a terrible guy. I oh, mean, yeah. like, worst. And I remember being like, sort of, when I was getting myself back in the sort of headspace of this, like I would have assumed because he was awful a whole season ago, where he was like going up to um. Christopher's mother and be like, I'll take that Walkman and shove it up your box. Like yeah, that. Right. Yeah, yeah. that was like 15 episodes ago. Yeah. Like he's just stayed like that. And what yeah. I think what Christopher says about him always stands out in my mind is like, and those jerk off eyebrows. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he's got I mean, a longer run as a like older sociopath on the show than anyone else. It's a great yeah. character, very yes. memorable character. And you're right that they do seem to like, as much as Chase is just like, dragging his ass across the finish line firing double birds off in every direction there's <laughs> clearly also a part of him that's kind of like you know what should happen to this guy after he gets killed yeah like, there's yeah, like a yeah. little bit of extra zest on it yes, like i think exactly. he's kind of having fun with that bit they added some immediate. seasoning to it and yeah. i think we all enjoyed it and you know the sight gag with that guy it's almost like it was uh, an homage to david chase loving to do sight gags with people who have in any like he loves a fat joke Mm -hmm. he loves a joke where someone has weird eyes he loves anyone who's got any part of their body um bigger or smaller or you know malformed he's just like (laughs) like he it's surprising this did this show have any little people in it i'm trying to think no surprisingly no i mean i feel like the uh what's the in bruges guy's name uh, yes, the, uh, the yeah. McDonough, the yeah, yeah. The Malcolm, McDonough Martin version McDonough. of the Sopranos Martin. would have had a lot of uh, a lot of little people in it. Yes, right. It is yeah. kind of bizarre that it did not too, especially for a show with this many dream sequences that they've really like kind mm-hmm. of have always like had their thumb on the scale, pressing like for extra dream heft. <laughs> yeah, you would yeah. think. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you know, like it, it's it feels like he's like that's just not his kink little people just aren't his kink is like anyone who is like morbidly obese yeah, and or grotesque. yeah grotesque in some way or just like anyone who works good for like a small sight gag that lasts about five seconds but Putting that the two babies in the car so that they're dressed identically is also kind of in the same universe as that yes yes it's like something that, like a little bit of extra uncanniness so that you know mm-hmm. that he's like underlining it and aware of it yeah yeah it's that but also is... that's just his for yucks like that's just his thing yes and and it carries on with that wonderful sopranos tradition of um, we're going to show you something awful and it's going to be hilarious. <laughs> and uh, they did a great job with it. So that is the end of Phil um, and uh, and the a- end of Agent Harris, who goes, damn, we're going to win this thing, which uh, I thought was cute. I remember at the time watching I, that. No, I you know, that's you know, that's a real thing, right? Yes, that's based on a real thing. What yes. Is? The, damn, that, we're going to win this thing. That line itself was something that there was like a sort of disgraced FBI agent who was a part of the I want to say like the Colombo crime there's one of the crime families from the 80s mm-hmm. yeah who was like probably doing something similar in terms of like favoring some party that was like giving him information with information yeah and reportedly did say that in one of his like um 
like underlings reported him for saying we're going to win this thing after hmm. the news of someone getting killed. Yes. And then he had to like the agent had to like go in court and be like I meant like society's FBI. winning. Yeah. Like yeah. everybody's yeah. winning. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Just... The royal we. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I love that. Yeah, I mean th- that to me was just like a great way. I th- I enjoyed that. I see Vince didn't like it, but that's cuz you you obviously never read the book The Five Families, which Clearly. Is, uh, yeah, no. A great book. Um, was it too on the nose for you, Vince? Is that basically? Um, it no, it felt like w- in a couple episodes ago, they've been doing this thing where like there's news reports about The Sopranos and and like they Geraldo is like interviewing mafia experts about like mm-hmm. what's going on and uh, it felt like they're making characters uh, our proxies where you know, like he's thinking that we, the audience are rooting for the Soprano crew in this Mm. war. And, uh, and then, and then we need, like, we need one character that represents us, like the way we're cheering for. And I was, I don't know. Yeah. It makes more sense that that was a real thing that they tried to crowbar in there, but, but it does kind of feel like, I don't know that I know how to use the phrase hat on a hat, but it is the sort of thing where like, it's already pretty clear that David Chase hates us for watching the show. (laughs) Like you don't need a guy who's like literally just this like testicular cop guy Mm -hmm. being like, this is you. That's what you're like. That's when you watch it, you sound and look like him. Right. Yeah. It's like, come on. Piece of shit. You think you're a good guy, but you're also bad. When like the nerd culture was a a big thing, I felt like there was always one character in in mm-hmm. the things that was also a fanboy like in uh like in one of the Star Wars movies where they had the the girl when she meets um the fucking uh what's the guy's the the black guy's name that's the stormtrooper that becomes like a good guy Finn Finn yeah, Finn like she fanboys out she fangirls out on Finn and it yeah, kind of Ro- it, Rose does yeah yeah and it kind of feels like that that it feels like it's part of that trope where they're making one of the characters like a fanboy for the Sopranos. And I was like, eh, I don't know. Yeah. I don't think I need yeah. it. If you're the Sopranos, you don't need to do something that's like mostly a move for like the CW shows in yeah, the Marvel it, universe. True. You can do better than that. It felt out, out of character universe, for like a fairly, um, not necessarily stoic, but like he's an FBI guy. Like he talks like a fed. He never, he doesn't really get excited over things. Uh, like he was like, he already hey. showed, he showed his cards that he was rooting for the Soprano crew by like reluctantly or whatever, giving the information to have him like fanboy out. Seem like they're gilding the lily a bit. I think they just really loved that. That was a real thing. And they're like, we're putting that, putting uh, yeah. that in there. Now yeah. that I know that it's a real thing. I think that's exactly what happened. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so no more Agent Harris, you know, bye-bye, Phil. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. <laughs> bye-bye. Get him out of here. Wait, bye-bye. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, so to wrap up another thing, um, this is the also the finale of um, all of the therapy storylines, which are wrapped up wonderfully with Tony going to visit AJ's therapist. At this point in the episode, AJ is like said, I'm going to join the army so that I can learn how to fly a helicopter so that I can eventually fly a helicopter for Trump, which mm. great logic. <laughs> uh-huh. yep. Totally makes sense. Where else are you going to learn that? Where I, else can you learn It's funny that? that his parents are horrified and it was like, it seemed like the one of the first good ideas that AJ's ever had. Yeah. Right. At that point, I, I think, especially in like 2007, when there was like this feeling of, um, well, certainly we all know this is a bad war and we're going to get out, you know, even though we didn't, you yeah. know what I mean? It's like, yeah. I, it does feel a little bit like I, I would have figured they would have been into it, but instead they're like, God damn it. He wants to die again. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. so, so they go and visit his therapist and, um, kind of, you know, try to dig a little, get some information on what exactly is going through AJ's head. And then uh, fucking Tony uses it, uses it as an opportunity to do his own therapy. And David Chase uses it as an opportunity to say, I and the rest of us are all tired of this bullshit. (laughs) Um, And I fucking love this scene. He says he wants to get past the hate, focus it only on the terrorists. I really can't reveal much more. Right. Even though we're paying. This whole therapy thing, I gotta tell you. What? My mother was a borderline personality. 
show what? I don't know if you knew that. No. <laughs> well, I did not have a very happy child. No? There was little love in the house. He's mentioned your mother very briefly. Very difficult woman. <laughs> Undermining. I tried to place her in a retirement community for her own good. She turned on me completely. You see, I never could please my mother. Just bye inc bye. an incredible <laughs> fucking joke. An incredible joke. Yep. The most self-aware they have been, I think, on the show in terms of the therapy scenes kind of repetitiveness where you're just kind of like <laughs> yeah he goes through the cliff notes of like six yeah. seasons in 10 seconds yes yes yep. he goes through everything where he's just like fucking you know uh my mother was like this retirement community i never could please her you know fucking just uh, and then you know finally you know he's she was a border borderline personality i love that he's like got the fucking dsm6 yeah. fucking diagnosis of his own mother so that was and, the as a as a confirmed therapy boy. That's what I loved about that scene was that there's a mm. way of being in therapy because effectively you can do it forever. You're not oh yeah. Gonna, it's not like a you know they don't give you like a certificate at the end of it and they're like right. you're no longer neurotic. Like <laughs> yeah, go they, and you do graduate likewise. from being yeah. a psycho. <laughs> right, but he's got that like it's a thing that can happen when you've been in therapy long enough that like he has like you said he's got like the thumbnail sketch of his whole shit and mm -hmm. he can just be like here's my, like, this is my diagnosis. Here's, like, the mm -hmm. other, like, the sorted traumas that are associated with it. And here's some, like, other, like, unenumerated, uh, like, issues that I have. And you can do all that in 90 seconds because you've been hearing yourself say the same shit and you've been told this by authority figures before. And yet that's not the same thing as insight. It's, like, the opposite right. of insight. Yes. Because you basically, at some point, you've just, like, you've learned your lines. Yeah. And you yes. know what you're supposed to be doing. And then you're just like, well, if I do this enough times, then I won't have this diagnosis anymore or whatever right and it's like and it works like that also on a meta level in here in which they were like oh the the engine of this story or kind of like the the way that we do this particular type of uh, exposition is he goes into therapy and he like learns something about himself that he then uses to do criminal stuff and uh and it's like it's the same thing where it's like after six seasons every therapy scene you're going like okay what are we learning anymore yeah. i don't i don't i don't know we're not i'm not getting that like insight anymore into this character there's like moments where yes you do but like at this point i know the character well enough to know where his resentments are to know why he does the things he does like there's no there's no surprises anymore so it's almost like they know that yeah and like carmela serves as the audience when he's like i never could please my mother yeah and she's she making like gym faces at him the whole time yeah, yes. which is, <laughs> yeah she's gym which, from the office facing yeah, she's him like it. this guy but yeah it's it is so it's fun. definitely like i think that's like it's not my personal takeaway with therapy but it does feel like mm -hmm. that's like for sure a finished thought for chase there that like yes. this is what you actually learn in therapy mm -hmm. yes is like yeah. how to like be the same forever and become like an expert of being that. Yes. <laughs> Which yes. is like kind of, you know, grim, but it's not, you know, not any less grim than Janice being like, the boy I never cared for. He can, he can fuck off, but I'm taking yeah. the other one. <laughs> yes. Like, There's a lot of grimness, you yeah. know? It's, I think, a very uh, cynical and uh, pessimistic worldview that David Chase has. And it yeah. makes me love him all the more. Um, but yeah, so that closes out the therapy um, we close out Polly with him passing on the promotion to Capo. Um, he was supposed to take over um, the Cifaretto Cif crew, and he mentions that everyone who's taken that crew is, has died, um, including Gigi, who uh, died on the toilet, which I fucking I love a good <laughs> Gigi callback. Um, and then, yeah, he says he's going to give it to Patsy then, and uh, Polly just he wants to live but not as much as he wants to be petty so he takes the job knowing full well that he's probably gonna die <laughs> uh be just because he doesn't want patsy parisi to take the job <laughs> yeah. over him he's like i don't want to answer to that fuck um which i love and then yeah we have that scene where he uh you know it ends with him sunning himself in front of satrials while a very cg cat uh sits near him and is supposed to be christopher this is the first time i noticed that the cat was um green screened on 
Mm. Did you guys notice, I didn't notice that? that but... Was it? I oh yeah, tell. that's funny. Yeah, I, early I, days I, technology there. I yeah, I never noticed it before, but I looked and I was like, oh yeah, 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 that's that's green screen. But I was yeah, I mean, who cares? Who gives a shit? It was um, a memor- I always like this when this happens in mm-hmm. uh, Sopranos too. I mean, it's more of a thing I associate with like Hallmark movies. Where like mm-hmm. they were just obviously filming on a fucking miserable day. There's a lot of really I mean, there's obviously like yes. the snow is fake, but every time they're outside in this, it is windy. Everyone looks upset. You there's mm-hmm. you can see their breath and it's not CG. That it's just like it's cold real, as shit. Yeah, it's some yes. January New Jersey shit. Like no snow, but everybody it just sucks. Yeah, <laughs> you're like, why is it not snowing when it is negative fifty degrees yeah. out? Yeah. Yeah. No, it is funny. I was watching some David Chase interviews. Um, to get prepared for this podcast to be upset at him and uh and he basically is like uh, what's one word you think of when you think of sopranos the person asked him and he says cold and then he talks about how every day of the set when we did something outside it was miserable and everyone was having a bad time and i was like hell yeah <laughs> that's, that's that the dream. that comes through um all right we have two more scenes left to discuss the first is the Wrapping up of Junior, which easily I, my least favorite storyline in this okay. episode. Like we already okay. did all this crap. I don't know if I'm just like over the whole dementia thing. Like there's no greater uh, insight that we're gonna get there. Like I don't mm-hmm. I don't know what mm-hmm. what they thought we were gonna get out of it. Like we've already wrapped up. You already we already wrapped up Junior with the Asian guy and that Beating whole thing. Him up. Yeah, like we did. We wrapped it up well, and then we're gonna go back to this. Ugh. Oh, I I disagree completely. And I think the reason I disagree is because it, for me, serves as it will serves a couple of purposes. One is some really great acting from both um, Dominic uh, Chinesey or whatever um, (laughs) and uh, and 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 James Gandolfini. Uh, (laughs) How do you pronounce his name? The guy who plays Junior? Chinesey. It's Chinesey. And. Um, yeah, hey, he's a little bit Chinesey, uh, <laughs> and uh, like fantastic acting from both of them. It serves that purpose, and it also serves the purpose of that ending line when Tony is like, "This thing of ours." I was involved with that. You my dad. You two ran North Jersey. We did. Yeah. Hmm. Well, that's nice. <laughs> and then he goes back to staring at birds. I thought that was, I thought a beautiful moment because it's like, it's a little sweet. Cause he's like, Oh, that's a, that's a cool thing to hear about, you know, in my, in his dementia stage, but also these birds are kind of dope though. Yeah. So I'm gonna keep what like, Oh, cool. Bye. Like, it's like, he <laughs> yeah. doesn't give a shit and it kind of shits on the entire thing. Like it earning a just that's nice is like, for Tony, I don't know. I feel like that's a an insult to anyone who builds their entire identity on being a mafia. Sure. Yeah, it's like that last the last fifty minutes of The Irishman, basically in one yeah. scene, where it's like a, a gradually diminishing Robert De Niro muttering to himself on the soundtrack, and while like nothing happens and nobody is redeemed in any way. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I, I've, I, there's just something about that that I, I've, I like. It, it was nice to feel touched in that way like i i i find it to be a really um effective scene emotionally where i'm just like oh this is so sad for like tony and for junior to like it all ends up here you know you're either fucking dead or you're in the can staring at birds Mm -hmm. at a in a fucking me i done both me (laughs) i did both i Uh, like the uh, you're right the chinese's performance is very good there. He looks more like the Six Flags man in this one than he <laughs> yeah. maybe ever has. It's like overwhelming. <laughs> it's really probably not the take. Yeah. <laughs> That's not the takeaway from this that I'm proudest of, but it is in my mm. notes where I was like, you should make sure that you mention this because he looks insanely like that guy. Yes. Yes, he does. And, um, you know. I can see how Vince might. I, I also personally like the scene pretty well, but I can mm-hmm. see. Vince's issue with it just in the sense that it does have that kind of the way that like the finale of a series that has like maybe not overstayed its welcome but like maybe not not overstayed its welcome you know it's just like been going on for a longish time yeah there is that tendency to like 
not just to tie things up, but to like tuck everybody into a bed and be like, th- like the end of uh, Six Feet Under, where they're literally like, here's how everyone dies. Right, right. And like, I actually like, that's something, I don't really like Six Feet Under very much. I liked that they did that, that they yeah. went that hard with it. But there is a tendency to like sort of, there's a, a tweet about this, about um, This Is Us, that at the end of every episode, all of the characters get together in a big bed and die. <laughs> <laughs> It's obviously not what the show is like, but there is this tendency to sort of just like wrap everybody up and be like, all right, well, there's that's a wrap on Uncle Junior. Everybody applaud. Yeah. All right. Now, who's next? Yeah, I, just, I feel like there's a tendency and I don't know, maybe it's just a me thing, but I feel like people find the idea of like Alzheimer's and dementia like more profound and cathartic uh, than I do. Like, I'm always like, I just I don't enjoy it. And I don't find anything. It's the scariest thing in the world. Yeah, yeah it's just, I don't, don't want to see it. I don't find anything profound or cathartic about it. It just reminds me of a thing that exists that sucks and uh, that's miserable. Yeah, yeah. yeah I feel like the, I, I, yeah, I understand that um, completely. I think it just for me, it's like, well, no, it serves. I think a, a very interesting purpose, you know, narratively in the show uh, with regards to all of the bullshit that these two have been through together. And it all just gets washed away. Yeah, it's nothing. It amounts to nothing. It did nothing for them. Right. And what does it matter? And this is how it ends. Um, And then the ending. The very famous ending. Mm -hmm. We're at Holston's Diner. Uh, Tony sits down. Do you think this was the beginning of that song just being inescapable? Because I feel like there was a good decade of Mm. uh, Don't Stop Believing just being everywhere all the time. Yeah, I think this is demonstrably it, right? Mm. Like, I feel like it that's been like be. talked about because it yeah. was the song was like kitsch. I mean, like it was you know it's what it is, but it was the sort of thing where like I think even the the fact that that's what he would put on was mm-hmm. like this is you know it's not even at the level of him driving around listening to Steely Dan doing right. dirty work. Like <laughs> yes, this is yeah. just like the absolute like corniest <laughs> it, it, song you could. It pick. is the height of kitsch, and it is like absolutely not the song. You expect the Sopranos to end with. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Of all the songs, like if they had chosen like that's a more, I would have been like, okay. <laughs> well, it doesn't like, literally even f- any Van Morrison song in any with Van it. Morrison. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't song. even exactly. really fit with Tony's taste in music. Like he's been more of, uh, I don't know, more of like a '70s classic rock. Um, right. And this is like I mean, post. Like Journey is like post classic rock, like commercial uh, right. pop rock. Yeah. Like it's a different era of rock that didn't seem like Tony was into before. But yeah, and 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 not only that, but it's like the song itself has no, it has no symbolic value to why it was chosen. Like the <laughs> "Don't Stop Believing" is not a theme of the. Yeah. Like you could you could do some real mental gymnastics and be like, "Don't stop believing." It's like d- about how you shouldn't stop believing in the American dream. No, it is uh, yeah. it is a choice that was made. Another fuck you. Another kind of like, wouldn't it be funny if you know? I just he plays. Don't stop believing, and a like, very like, San Francisco band that has like nothing to do with nothing to do with Jersey. Jersey. It's not a Springsteen song. Yeah. It's not fucking it's not Rolling Stones. It, like they do. No, a lot of it's got Stones like shit. kind of a like the I the way that I would tie it to Springsteen. And this is the mental gymnastics that you were just describing. Yes, I'm about yes. to do a floor routine for you that there is Hell like yeah. that. So in the way that like Springsteen has these songs where he's getting by on, on vibe and like adjective choices, you know, <laughs> sure. where it's kind of like yeah. jungle land or something like that, where you're kind of like, I don't even think this was your lived experience or anything. You're just singing about cars. <laughs> and then like this guy's playing a saxophone at some point and it makes me feel feelings. Yeah. That like don't stop believing is kind of like that in that it's very like grand gesture, like emotional, and yet like it doesn't scan. Like if you were to like yeah. read the lyrics, you'd be like, There's not a South Detroit. Like what are you like <laughs> what are we getting at here even? Like what because it's like the, you know, like living just to find emotion and all that. Like mm-hmm. it all works together, and yet it's the sort of thing that it, you know if you really want to give chase credit for like extra yes. double bank stuff, it is a bunch of it's like a Christopher feelings Nolan and plot. emotions mm-hmm. it's- gathered very densely around a core that doesn't exist. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's a Christopher <laughs> Nolan plot where like, yeah, it, exactly. Like if you, 
it works great because it makes you feel like tense and mm-hmm. uh, and like oh shit, some big shit's about to go down. But like if you if you like pause it and like work through what's actually happening in the story, it's kind of like nothing. But yeah, uh, but it's like the backwards fight from Tenet is so cool that it doesn't like it doesn't matter to you that you don't understand why anyone is doing any of the things yeah. that they're doing. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I I feel like that is. All of those are possibilities that it was very, you know, it was considered and they would just were like, this is a very important song to choose for the ending. But or <laughs> I think he just chose it at fucking random and was like, hey, yep. here's a song. I think, Fuck you. I think yep. they literally just had him looking through. They had a shot of him looking through the thing of all the music and stuff. And they were like, okay, another shot of him pressing the buttons. We don't know which buttons he pressed. And then they looked through the shots they had, and they're like, it's either this or Magic Man. Yep. <laughs> and uh, and uh, and honestly, Magic Man would have made more sense. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, but it was like they were just like, ah, oh, fuck it. They probably saw a few different cuts of it, and they went. That would with, be a nice little hold project on. to just have- recut this scene with like Barracuda. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. see, if, see if it works. I have an article on why they chose that song. Oh, my God. Yes, please. Uh, The series finale of The Sopranos included the song Don't Stop Believing because the crew had quite a negative reaction to it. Uh, (laughs) I knew it. I knew it. Chase is just finding people he doesn't even know and punching them in the throat. (laughs) Good man. People who work for him. It was recently (laughs) revealed in an interview by Chase uh, on WTF with Mark Maron. Uh, when figuring out what the song was going to be during the selection process, Chase narrowed it down to a few options, including Al Green's Love and Happiness. When discussing it with the, his crew, they had an impassioned reaction to Don't Stop Believing that he did not expect, which shifted his consideration. Yeah, they all said, no, please yeah. don't. And he said, I'm going to do it, motherfuckers. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Cry more, pigs. I live off your tears. Yeah. I didn't know Journey. This is, this is an actual Chase quote. I didn't know Journey was the answer. In pre-production, there was going to be, this, uh, be a song at the end Tony is going to play in the jukebox. I was in the scout van with the department heads, and I had never done this before. I said, listen, I'm going to talk about three songs that I'm thinking about for the ending of the show. They went, ugh, Jesus Christ, no, don't do that. Ugh, fuck. And I said, well, that's it. That's the one. I wasn't saying that just to throw it in their face. That was kind of my favorite, and had and it had got a reaction of some kind. So I can make this song lovable, which it had been. Basically, he's saying he chose it because fuck you, which is what it feels yeah. like. Yes, yes. Yeah. Every single piece of evidence, every interview leads me to believe this man did an entire fuck you to not only the fans, but the industry at large, the whole show about fuck you. And it's like an incredible thing to not chicken out when it comes to a show that is becomes so popular. And so like he could ride out easily on how brilliant he is. And in some ways he is. Um, but like at that moment, I think most of us would be too afraid to be like, I can't end with a fuck you, dude. Like yeah. this is <laughs> yeah. like, I got to give them what they want, man. Yeah. Cause I got to secure my legacy and a fuck you could get a really bad reaction. And then, or we could be legends. <laughs> and yeah. I he definitely think... did come up with the thing that people would be talking about 15 yes. years later, as opposed to any of the other options, even the other beloved shows that you can watch where they like tuck every character into bed mm-hmm. at the end of it. It's like, all right, yeah, I guess I know how that ended and it's over. The other yeah. thing that I will say that's impressive about that though, is that like the urge to like give not like a dignified ending or whatever, cause it's not, these aren't likable characters. He doesn't right. like them, whatever that like to, go out this hard and this negative like not like negative negative, but just like to not give you anything to hold on to nobody escapes nobody is redeemed nobody learns anything even (laughs) that like he must have been so sick of this stuff like even more than i think i understood at the time yes because the hype over this coming up to this was overbearing like he was doing a lot of press he clearly never liked to do it it mm-hmm. was already obvious that he like this whole sixth season was made basically like at gunpoint because there is a contract to fulfill. <laughs> and he still managed to surprise me by uh, being even more spiteful about the whole thing. I mean, yes. I think this is something that's very particular to his generation. Like I was watching the uh, George Carlin documentary the other night and mm-hmm. uh, George Carlin reminded me of my dad a lot in the sense that like 
that generation of people that went to, they grew up going to these like really aggressive, heavy handed, uh, Catholic schools. And it gave them, um, forever just this absolute Complex. reactionary hatred of like all things authority and all things like organized mm-hmm. religion. And I sense that very much in David Chase because I feel like the, probably the last two seasons he had so many people like in his ear telling him what to do with the finale and he probably had all these people to try and please with this who had all, all had like these ideas and these principles of uh, you know what are the fans going to like like how should you go out like how are you going to mm-hmm. secure your legacy and like this just felt like that very much that same reactionary being like you know what Fuck you! I will absolutely uh, burn myself uh, in yes. the hopes that you get yeah. singed. Yeah, which is funny because it's not necessarily there's like no actual politics to that. Like there's not right. It's a it's a worldview, no. but yes. it is like it's, it's not like the, doesn't reflect an ideology. No, it's that, apolitical yeah, as it's hell. Fuck you, dad! Yeah. Like the whole thing yeah. is fuck yeah. you, dad. You can go either way with that. I mean, I think it is inherently reactionary because I think those that same impulse you see in a lot of. Uh, boomers who are like i'm gonna do racism now because fuck you that's right. why it's like this, <laughs> that's exactly right that it's yeah. this love of negative attention and this idea that somehow you're supposed to be surprised that someone was like when they tried to make me fight in an illegal war i said fuck you right and it's like good good for you and then they're like and when they tried to tell me to wear a mask in the supermarket i said fuck you again it's like well wait, 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 wait. <laughs> exactly yeah. exactly and, and and it's what i think i love in particular about David Chase's version of this is that it doesn't seem to um it really doesn't seem to be that deep. It really seems to be about oh because I met most like I've met a lot of you fans and you don't deserve anything good, which <laughs> is like uh, that's beautiful. Like right, that level the- of spite and disdain for like anyone who likes your art You're from the from the intellectuals to the doofuses and then a little bit kind of siding with the doofuses even though he also pissed those off but being yeah. like yeah no fuck the therapy and the dream sequence stuff like car explode aj cool now like yep. that is head gets smush head gets smushy <laughs> yeah exactly and so yeah the i you know i don't think david chase is you know coming from a place of He's not politically coming from any place. I think it's an apolitical statement. It is, and in general, kind of a punk rock nihilistic fuck you. And I think I've grown to appreciate those a lot more as I've gotten older because I've, you know, you come to a place in life where the amount of people, especially nowadays, telling you how to do the thing that you are doing and they are consuming like people who tell you what kind of you know stand-up is good or like what they what they people constantly feeling open to critique you i just beyond just like oh this joke or whatnot but making it this big bigger thing if you don't do this you are bad the empowerment of fans has been yes basically a universal negative like god yeah god if only kevin feig had a little bit of uh david chase in him like how much better (laughs) yeah that's actually a really interesting point that i hadn't thought about too the idea of this being like the last sort of singular statement that you could make because no hbo show had been as big as this before this that he was like grandfathered in in a way that like you wouldn't otherwise be able to be that like even game of thrones which was as big as it was Mm -hmm. by the time you get down to the end of it they're just like a million fucking guys you never saw before on set being like there need to be six more tits in this scene find a place for them also there's a dragon now (laughs) you know it's just like some dude from the whatever information services at the Mm -hmm. algorithm you know department totally that you need to have this totally and and i think also like i look at the game of thrones it was was people it's all people doing their idea of someone else's thing like it's Mm -hmm. none of them are empowered to like do the thing that they really want it seems like like that whole last season of game of thrones is like is a bunch of guys in a room thinking what would George R. R. Martin do and yes. they have no blueprint yeah. for it and like even worse it's like you 
like they're trying to do an impression of someone else and that's yeah, always no blueprint bad. but also no real vision outside yeah. of like right. the thing that they've adapted and like but yes that's and also a lot of pressure i think not just from the the viewers but from people who read the books from george R. R. martin himself maybe you know the idea that like these guys i think unlike the sopranos ending i really do feel like the people who made the game of thrones ending um, and that entire last season really wanted the fans to like it. Oh, they course. really thought they were doing them. something good. Yeah. Yeah. That, and that's what destroyed them. It yeah. was this attempt to please the piggies rather than following like a singular artistic instinct or just kind of like... Or um, just saying, uh, fuck you, piggies, like David Chase. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah which is, I think, in You're and of itself an artistic instinct. And I, yeah. don't like and I think you could definitely, like, you can take The Sopranos and break it down into, like, 80% of it is following a singular artistic instinct. The back 20% is fuck you, piggies. Yes. But, like, it's all, he's saying it with his whole chest both times. I mean, like, you gotta, mm-hmm. and it's it's for sure him. Like, there's not a sense oh, of, yeah. you know, meddling from somebody above yeah, uh, you know, in the mix, which like, yeah, that part of it does make it seem even when you disagree with it, even when it's a miss. And I think there's still there's stuff that he missed. In, even in this totally. episode, there's moments that are misses, you know, but yeah. like he's missing them on his own terms. And I think that definitely does stand out. Yeah, um, it's watch for sure. And it's like, you know, you, it's why we're all everyone's taking a second look at the, you know, George Lucas Star Wars prequels. And everyone's, you know, kind of going like, yeah, they are bad, objectively. For the Terrible. record, I am not taking a second look at the George. Yeah, Lucas. I'm not going to do that. But I do think the idea of reappraising it because it's like, yes, there it's no one was saying no to him, you know, and like, yes. and so you got what you got. But like, it is definitely like one of those like last time at that scale that anyone's going to get that much room. Right. Oh, yeah. And and Including I think him. Yeah. And, and I, uh, that, I guess what I'm saying is that like. Where the other side of the coin being this like machine learning software that creates the slop that we know and like and turns everything into a Marvel movie, turns everything into a Big Mac. And, uh, you know, you you look at that and then you go, OK, well, if I compare that to these terrible George Lucas movies, at least George Lucas has had a vision and it might have been a really bad vision, strangely <laughs> racist yeah. at points. Strangely like, racist, un, for unmotivated reasons. Unmotivated I mean, racist, shoehorning like, space Jews of, into there. Exactly, apropos of nothing. Um, but at Have least you, it was a vision. You've heard that interview where they're where it's like an old tape where they're he and Spielberg and I forget who else are talking about. They're they're like coming up with the idea for Indiana Jones. And George Lucas is pushing really hard for yes. Marion Ravenwood to be like eleven. A child. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like, what the fuck? And everybody's like, I don't know about that. George is like, no, no. Uh she was a child when she says I was a child, it's because they had a weird relationship when he was a grown man and she was eleven. Trust me on this, please. <laughs> and everybody's please like, trust me. Everybody's like, no, that's weird. It's amazing. And like, whatever. I don't I don't want anything like what George Lucas... I would love the wealth, I guess. But the idea of just like constantly being in like this flow state of you're always having ideas, they're Mm. all bad now. (laughs) But every one of them that you come up with, you deliver as if you're just like issuing like the Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. And and people are always have to be like, well, it is a... George Lucas did have that idea. Like, you know, the, the one about him naming characters in the Star Wars video games where they were going to create, they, there was going to be a new Darth in the game. And the rule was that, like, you couldn't just do that. There's, like, all this right. in Legal the universe. Shit. So you have to go to George. And they went and they were like, we want to create a, a villain for this game that we're doing. Like, it's important. You know, obviously, we're going to be very respectful with it. Do you have a name? And he just instantly said Darth Icky, and they were like, "Do you have any? Do you have any <laughs> yeah, other? What names? else? What else you got? What else you got? Uh, and other- Dark Icky. He's like a gooey, gooey <laughs> goblin. <laughs> it's like, the part of it that I love is just the like the no hesitation, like just Reggie Miller shooter's confidence. Like, being yes. like I was hoping you would ask me that. Like his name yeah. is Darth Balls. <laughs> yeah, he sucks. <laughs> <laughs> like. He's- just shooting from the fucking half, like the, the fucking logo. half court. Yeah, yeah, right from the logo with a little bit of fucking pastrami and like <laughs> mustard stains on his shirt. Darth Icky. So <laughs> Next. I, got, I have one, George. I know this is exceptionally long, but can I tell the one? Oh, George it's fine. Lucas this is the final episode, baby. Right. So 
uh, this is only, this is totally gratuitous. I just it's a, a thing about George Lucas that I want more people to know. Mm-hmm. I know that millions of people listen to this podcast, so I, I millions get it out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. many maybe for this millions. episode a hundred million. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, absolutely. Uh, because I'm on it. So mm-hmm. a friend of mine, a friend of a friend, worked in food service in San Francisco, and it's an Italian restaurant, like high end Italian restaurant, and there you know had a private dining room as these places do, and there was an order that came in and they were like, this is going to the private dining room. Do not say anything to the person who ordered it. Don't bother them. Don't make eye contact. And and it was, the order was just a lot, just a huge meatball on a plate, like the size of like a softball (laughs) by itself. There might've been some sauce. I don't remember in, the story when I see it in my mind, it's just a, a, a wad, a dry like meat meatball wad from Aqua Teen Hunger Force. Yeah. <laughs> like, and so he carries it into the uh, dark dining room, private dining room. George Lucas is in there by himself with a napkin tucked into his shirt. He placed the meatball in front of him and he starts sawing away at it. Say nothing and leave. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the As George he's leaving, Lucas he hears him go, "Hi, friend," and then he's just t- talking to the meatball he's eating. <laughs> I don't Your like- name is Lumpy. <laughs> Jedi like, Master I, Lumpy. I love meatballs, but the thing about mm-hmm. them is uh, usually they're not dry enough. So I was wondering. If, uh, <laughs> I you love can make the, me idea. the largest, uh, driest meatball that you guys have. It's like. It's like don't don't look at him when he's once you give it to him don't look and then your friend like takes a peek back and he's just stuffing it not into his mouth but into his neck meat yeah, like, just, <laughs> just under his tongue somehow oh, yeah, yeah, exactly <laughs> just like getting that that neck waddle like more and more thick and you're like oh that's how he does it yeah also the idea of going to like you know really good Italian restaurants in San Francisco. So probably one of the best restaurants in the United States and just mm-hmm. ordering off menu and being like, what do you think you can make me a uh, one large meatball? <laughs> just yeah, one. just one's one, good, just but one. it better be large or else. Yeah, I it's gotta be one. big or else I'll be hungry in order too. Yep. <laughs> um, oh, fantastic. But yeah, anyways, George I brought Lucas you the shot, shot put ball to demonstrate the size <laughs> of the meat that I would like you to make me. <laughs> uh, you got an actual round. George Lucas invitation. I'm very impressed. <laughs> yeah, that was really good. That was really good. I the one thing I appreciate about George Lucas is I feel like every other, you know, famous person, their kids are in show business and like are kind of obnoxious. Yeah. And I like the fact that George Lucas had like one daughter who became like an MMA fighter and has nothing to do with show business at all. And that is solid. Great. I mean, like yeah. if the alternative is like you would think of all the people with like that level of success and distance from the world, like that's the dude that should have had a Max Landis somehow, but he didn't. Oh yeah, he just had right. Like, yeah, yeah, it's great. Well, I think George Lucas and David Chase are very similar in that sense, in which they're both auteurs, they're both geniuses, um, and they both love meatballs. Yeah, um, <laughs> that's true. Yes, a- and uh, you know, it ends. The show ends with fucking the. Them eating onion rings, Meadow failing at parallel parking for a while, and then it's just cutting to black. And um, yeah, man, I would say I probably if I had a favorite scene, it would be um, the end um, or also the scene with Tony in therapy. I think those are my favorites. Um, I don't have a least favorite. I think it's all brilliant. Uh, Vince, what was your favorite? What's your least favorite? I mean, I've said my favorite. I still think it's the shot that he should have gone out on. It's actually like one of the most memorable shots in all of The Sopranos to me is just mm-hmm. uh, Polly tanning himself, shooing the cat away from Satriel. It's just excellent shot. I love that one. Uh, yeah. Least favorite, obviously, I've also mentioned that is uh, I feel like we could have, I could have done without Junior this episode. Sorry. Fair. I love Junior and I, he's a great, and Dominic Chianese is a great actor, mm-hmm. but uh, yeah. I feel like Mr. Already wrapped, Chinese. I feel like we could have done without it. That's just me. Yeah. Uh, David, do you have like a favorite or a least favorite scene yeah, or a scene the, we didn't talk about? The therapy scene is incredible. I'm glad that you pulled the clip because the, the scene between Tony and Janice is like, in some ways, is extraneous to what we're, you know, the broader mm-hmm. direction of the episode. But it's just such a perfect bit of very old fashioned TV comedy writing to me that I loved it. Like her. <laughs> yeah. And also, it's nice to see that, like, in some ways, that's like a farewell to Livia as well. That there's just like the echo of like a poor you, like in the yes, background, like yes. hovering over that scene like a ghost. Yeah. 
Yeah, I almost feel like that ending was a little bit poor oh, you. So yeah, it's like absolutely. in a way yeah. that was that's an alternative title for um, this is uh, poor you. Um, my other alternative title is uh, Yeet. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was wondering because, if somebody was going to make that connection. I'm glad you did. Yeah, you know, instead of uh, Yates, he says Yeets. Um, so it's almost like they yeeted mm. all over our faces. <laughs> um, the other uh, alternate title is LOL KYS, which is just uh, laugh out loud, kill yourself. <laughs> just because I feel like that's what David Chase is saying. Yeah. Um, and if I had to give this episode a letter grade and i've thought hard about this and i know we've been doing this for 86 episodes i know that we all have different feelings about the letter grades we give but i earnestly and honestly say that this episode is a solid b plus vince what do you give this episode yeah um you know i really after six seasons arguably seven seasons I mm -hmm. feel like this show finally earned itself an A minus. So congratulations to oh, David Chase. Oh wow! For, uh, yeah, kind Becoming of like a salutatorian of my heart. Right. It's one of those Oscars you give to you know. It's like eh, the movie wasn't great, but he's old and they've been doing all. <laughs> this is like yeah. When Re Return of the King got Best Picture, it was like it's for the whole thing, not yeah. just yeah, that made Lord of the Rings. Twelve hours of movies for Christ's sake! Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. What are we not going to give them a shiny trophy? Um, <laughs> like, David Sting. I don't really listen to his music, but the fact that he's doing it, I respect that. That's kind of yeah, what they I respect did. That. That's what they did for uh, Peter Jackson. No one actually yeah. wants to watch all of Peter Jackson's tedious ass, boring shit. But they're yeah. like, you know what? The fact that I he's do. doing it, I respect that. I like I the ones that he's making now where they're so the frame rate is so high that it's like you're there, but like you don't want to be there. Right. It's <laughs> World War One. It's like being they're like, really it's like close you're to in Sean World Astin. War One. Yeah. And it's like, why would I want to be in World War One? <laughs> it's like the one thing I don't want. That's from a the movie going number experience. one thing I don't want. <laughs> yeah. So I respect uh, yeah. Vince's opinion and I respect yours. I think uh I am gonna land probably exactly between the two, and I'm gonna wow. give it like a highly approving B plus. Mm. Okay. Yeah. yeah. A B plus well, plus, yeah. A B it is. plus or plus. an A minus minus. It's like a musical yeah. thing. It's like, it's an A flat <laughs> mm -hmm. or a B sharp. It's both. Yeah. It's a depends who you ask. It's all the same to us. It is a solid B plus episode of The Sopranos, and you know what? It's a solid B plus series. The yeah, Sopranos. In respect, y'all have watched the whole thing. I think that's that's pretty high praise. I think so too. I mean, B plus. You really can't do better than that. No. Nope. I mean. We're just leaving room for other shows that might reach beyond to maybe A minus level or even solid A level. And um, and I think, Vince, I think we've reached our conclusion on what that would be. Mm. Um, it we has certainly been, have. Yes. Well, it has been 20 years um, <laughs> in in June since the release of this show. Um, and we've decided, you know to rewatch one of the greatest TV shows ever made, The Real World. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> it is going to, Yes. Treme. No, we are going to rewatch The Wire. Yeah. That is going to be the next one. And I know there's some people out there who are like, how dare you? You should have done Mad Men. You should have done Boardwalk. You should have done this. You should have done Breaking Bad. I understand it's that there's a lot of things. It's too obvious a choice, but the thing is, at a certain level of obviousness, you kind of have to do it, right? Like, yeah. Right. That's kind of how I felt. I felt like I was getting to the point where I was like, the only reason I'm not doing, the, uh, thinking to not do The Wire is because it's obvious. And that's not a good enough reason. And I will say The Wire, whenever you would say like, oh, Soprano is my, my favorite show of all time, I would always kind of have to be like, ah, I don't know if I could say that it's better than The Wire because The Wire, um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's the, it's the show that I have watched uh the most times um, yeah and enjoyed it every time on a rewatch level especially it just hits these like different notes where it's like it's a really dense show and it's like very rare that you find a show that is dense and informative and real and yet also is like very catchphrase heavy mm. it's a show in which catchphrases are make i would say uh, a gratuitous amount of appearances for a show that's supposed to be 
the greatest show ever yeah, for a show that's like 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 lifted up to the level it is lifted up it sure has a lot of what did what the hell did i do yeah. like that is like <laughs> that's McNulty's... the david simon experience right there yes it's like the guy is capable of creating a show that is you know a legit contender for the best show that ever mm-hmm. existed and yet also He's like the guy that's on Twitter calling, on Twitter. you know, calling Mitch McConnell a fuck knuckle, and you have yeah. to be like, wow, same <laughs> yeah, exactly. Too, huh? I've never, yeah. I've never been so in the tank for an artist whose Twitter persona annoys me that much. Yeah, it's, it's pretty crazy. It's incredible, and like, it, and like, I am like a huge David Simon piggy. Like, I mm-hmm. watched every episode and season of the deuce and i think it's incredibly uh-huh. underrated and uh yeah huge David i'm a big Simon. homicide guy that was a that yeah. was like a gateway show for me that was yeah. the first show that i think i like not I just, just that started... i realized it could be that good but that also like a thing i cared about that other people didn't care about that you watched on a screen right that was the beginning of me uh becoming this way yeah now you're this way forever yeah, i know i can't do anything and, about but i think it. part of the thing that makes Chase. a great artist is having uh the boldness to be cringe sometimes and uh yes that's maybe why i, I appreciate david simon yeah so it's it's a different type of um fuck you energy that comes from david simon um and i do think it's a, like there's an earnestness and a cringeness to him that mm-hmm. i i kind of enjoy you know like it's very unlike The Sopranos in a million ways. Number one, I think it is explicitly political, which I think is good, as opposed to us being like Sopranos about imperialism. Yeah, like this is like no, this is this it's it, it is explicitly political, um, and um, it is also something that is carried by not by the acting, which is not yeah. something that you would see. It is notable like, for like one of the best shows of all time. It's notable how few uh, good like, actors careers it made. Yeah. Right. Know? And and not not to say that there aren't people on that show who did like terrific performance. There's a lot of terrific performances, but it is a weird amount of non-actors and people doing ju- uh, a just OK enough job, but not you don't notice it. And it's almost like, well, then did they do a good job? It's hard to tell. But anyways, The Wire is a great we'll show. Save that for our next podcast. Then. Exactly. And um, also, you know, fucking it's uh, it's you guys. You guys will like it. You've already seen it. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be fun. So it has been it has been a wonderful, wonderful time to have you on here, David, uh, David Roth. We thank you for for coming in in the clutch for these last these last uh, episodes, you know, for the, I am I, like know. I said it in an email and I'm going to go ahead while we're while we're talking about celebrating being cringe. Yeah, I'm honestly like honored to have been asked to do this one. I was honored oh. to do the other ones too, but this is like, I don't know. I I love what you all are doing. I love this show, and I'm happy to have been given the cleanup spot. So thank you for that. I I thank you. appreciate it. Thank you. We we uh we do it for you. We do it for all of you out there who love to hear two people talk about dicks and titties <laughs> and and TV shows. Um, all it and takes I, is one kid. Yeah. Wants to hear about dicks and titties. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You know, I may not change the world, but I guarantee you, one of the listeners of this podcast will change the world because <laughs> they'll hear enough about titties. <laughs> um, but David, we, we truly love having you on. Can we count on you to uh, also be on our Wire podcast? Hell yeah, man! That's one of the few shows I feel as strongly about as The Soprano. So yes, I would love to do it. Fuck yeah. And where can people find you on the internet and shit? Well, that's a great question, man. <laughs> uh, so Defector.com is where most of my writing is. I do a podcast mm-hmm. there with uh, Drew McGarry uh, called The Distraction. I do a po- podcast about Hallmark movies with Jeb Lund. Uh, Hell yeah. It's Christmas Town. <laughs> and uh, I'm on Twitter at David underscore J underscore Roth. Yeah. No conclusory right. underscore. Yeah. But- so lis- listen to all, lis- listen to his podcast, read his writing fantastic guest fantastic human being we love you which is why we asked hey, you on for this last much. one Back thank you, you. and uh and i love all of you out there you're all great i i i truly like this is you know i hate to we're we're all being bitches right now so let's just be <laughs> bitches you know like um let's just do it and be bitches like yeah like, <laughs> <laughs> exactly uh we are legendary bitches right now but like really this has been a really fun experience we started this podcast as a side project to the frock cast because we were like oh fuck it the sopranos is a good show and why not you know and we knew there was a thousand other sopranos podcasts out there you know contrary to what we've been saying this whole time we're not actually the world's only sopranos podcast um and 
we kind of were like, this is a side project just for funsies. And then the pandemic happened and everyone started listening, uh, started watching The Sopranos again and listening to the show. And I really, um, I'm really grateful for everyone who uh, has stuck with us this whole time. It's been really nice. Vince, um, what do you have to say that's sweet? Ooh, tough. Uh, yeah, I agree. I agree with all of those things. <laughs> I just want you to be human. What do you? Like, I don't know. <laughs> Come on, buddy. Let's let's. Do you somewhere. know how hard it is for me to sit still for two and a half hours? It's so so hard. I know. I know, I and know. Then you want I could me to s- come up with something earnest at the end of it. Yes, it's be been, earnest. It's been very fun uh, doing this podcast and uh, and hearing everybody's feedback on it. It's uh, yeah. All right, that's a that's a, a bit lot. much. I think that's a little bit much. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's kind of a little bit weird. Okay, well, despite <laughs> what he just said, that was super weird. Uh, <laughs> I mean, just way too cringe for me. Um, uh, yeah, no, we really love uh, everyone who's reached out to us, and um, we do hope in the future, obviously, to do some live shows. Um, you know, the downside of the pandemic was obviously that we had to cancel our live show because the pandemic happened, but also you would have never known about the show if the pandemic hadn't happened. So I, I want to thank Vince. I want to thank all of the guests that we've ever had. Um, I want to thank our producer, Brent Flyberg, who's done a terrific job. Brent is uh, he's a good guy, hilarious dude, a uh, great comedian. Writes and, a great uh, description for every single episode. Yes, he does, and he he you know he puts in work and he fucking makes this so much easier for us to do. And uh, yeah, so send him a lot of love. Um, and yeah, patreoncom slash broadcast. The eight dollar tier gets you a shout out. Here are. Our final $8 tier or more um, Patreon piggies. Uh, and um, Vince, everyone kind of came in uh, last minute to yeah. get the <laughs> shout out. So I hope you have your fucking name hat on, dude, because oh. this is insane. I mean, I'm just going to do like whew, like word association. I mean, I always kind of do, but uh, yeah, that's this one how you might do be it. more shooting from the hip than most of them. I'm just going to warn you. Yeah, but also, you know, you wait till the last minute. This is kind of what you got. I mean, you know, yeah. hey. All right. The first one is Anthony Fortelny. Ah, Fortelny. We, we call this guy Slurp Juice. Okay. Anthony Fortelny. <laughs> Fortnite, Slurp Juice. You know, Fortnite. Know. No, yeah, that makes yeah, sense. All right. Okay. Next is Josh Kane. Yeah, we call this guy Velasquez. Why, uh, maybe I shouldn't ask why. So Josh Velasquez Kane. <laughs> I don't um, know. Sure. I just thought Cain Velasquez. I don't know. I'm terrible. No, it works. Um, yeah. Okay. Next, we have uh, Raven Allen Corvus Corax. Wow. Yeah. We're going to call this guy, girl, uh, whatever. Uh, we're going to call him Quad. He's got four names. Quad. Yeah. yeah. He's got the four names. Raven Allen, Quad, Corvus Corax. Uh, next is uh, Michael uh, Doherty. 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 Yeah. Call this guy 90210. Okay, sick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get that very one. good. I uh, do. Uh, next is Anthony De Palma. Oh, is that Brian's kid? We call him Scarface. <laughs> nice. Uh, okay, next we have Matthew Theakston. Uh The Lisp. <laughs> yeah, I guess it is a lispy name. Theakston. Yeah, that's going to be hard. <laughs> I hope he doesn't have a lisp. Sorry, Matthew. Um, next is Brandon Dawson. Oof. Uh, yeah, we call this guy the Creek. Okay, Dawson's Creek. Got yep, it. Got uh, that one. Yeah. All right. Uh, next is Mark Alonghi. Yeah, blink, blink, one eighty two. Why? One isn't one of those guys named Delong. Yeah, Tom Delong. That's where I was. That's oh, where I Mar- okay, okay. Um, uh, yeah, that works. Uh, next is Daniel Groves. We call this guy the Forest. Yeah, Danny the Grove, seeing the the forest. Danny the, the forest groves. Yeah, yeah. Okay, you got it. You know, yeah, it works. Um, next is Nick Taylor, old rough and ready. <laughs> Hell yeah. Okay, next is Pam Claridge. Mm. Yeah, we call uh, we call her. Uh, um. Oh boy, <laughs> that's a tough one. That's a tough one. Uh, Claridge, Pam, we, Pam. We call her uh, the sp- the spray. Yeah, there we go. Mm-hmm. I was gonna, th- yeah, because the spray on, you know, olive oil or canola is one of those. Yeah. 
Pam Canola Claridge, the spray. Okay, Nikolaj Nikolaj uh, Lausus. I think it's Nikolai, but yeah. Oh, why is there a J though? That's because that's how you pronounce the J in some of those Scandinavian Weird Slavic lang- languages. Disgusting. Yeah. All right, uh, Nikolai Lausus. We're gonna call Nikolai the truth. Nikolai oh. the truth Lausus. Yeah, Nikolai truth lying truth. I got it. Uh, next, Joseph Barker. Snoop. <laughs> okay. Um, after that is uh, Mark Dammit. Is that, a, is that a real name? I can't find any other last name except for Dammit. Dammit. Um, we're going to... Oh, damn, I already used Blink-182. Blink-182, <laughs> yeah, it's too late. <laughs> and that person was also named Mark. Uh, we're going to call... Hold on. Hold on. Mm-hmm. We're going to call him The River. Oh, because you damn river. Yeah, Very that's what you good. do to rivers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yep. Okay, next is David Childress. Uh, um, we call him... <laughs> the molester? I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, yeah, we call this guy Big D. I don't know. Okay, David. Big D, the molester child dress. Okay, I'm sorry, man. Uh, <laughs> Big D's better. Um, next is Nick Bova. Well, <laughs> you call this guy D's nuts because yeah. Bova D's nuts. Um, yeah, yeah, Nick Bova D's nuts. Mm-hmm. Um, next is Doug Hamilton Evans, the founding father over here. All right, yep. you can do better than that. Well, look, they're not going to be great. Well. Doug sent a very sweet message in which he told me um, or told us please that he loves the show. He said, please don't use Hamilton as the basis for my nickname. No, he didn't say it. he. He told me at first he thought I sucked and now he likes me. And I was like, sick. <laughs> um, but I think that's fair. Um, Doug Hamilton Evans, the founding father. We'll call him that. Why not? Next, Jeremy Sexton. Mm, we call this guy the virgin. Yeah, yeah, Jeremy, the version six, mm-hmm. Andrew Ferrari. Yeah, we call this guy, uh, you know, friggin', uh, oh, he's got a car. He's got a car for a name. Um, yeah. We call this guy Enzo, Enzo Ferrari. Okay, yeah. Andrew Enzo Ferrari, that's very good. Addison Firth. Costello, because uh, okay. Addison just makes me think that should be like an Elvis Costello song. Yeah, sure. Addison. Mm-hmm. 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 Uh, and then we have Kyle Herman. Pee-wee. <laughs> That's good. Uh, Heather Rivers. Damn it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that works. No, we call uh, her we call her Dental Dam. Dental Dam it. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, next is Brian Husa. <laughs> Jar Jar. <laughs> <laughs> Who's a Brian? Okay. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, is someone is someone hungry over there? Yeah. They're all okay. Hu- we're all hungry. We're almost done. There's only five more left. Josh, Josh Edge. E G E. Eggy. Eggy. Edge. Uh, the omelet. The omelet. Okay. Mm-hmm. Dylan. Dylan Masick. Mm-hmm. Uh, the flu. Okay. Gabriel Garza. Double G. Double G, G. We call him G squared. We call him G squared. Sam Duran. Uh, yeah, we call this guy Big Stinky Fruit. <laughs> okay. And finally, like the durian. You know, you got. No, it. I didn't know. I don't know Big Stinky Fruit, but I like it. Durian Just, fruit. Uh, it's a big stinky fruit. I've never heard of it. You never um, heard of it? I don't know about things. It's a big fruit that stinks. Sick. It's Lastly. <laughs> Um, Marco Lopez. Polo. Polo. All right. Those are your shout outs for the $8 tier. Patreon.com slash fraudcast. I want to remind everyone that in between us starting, ending this show and starting the new one, um, we're going to be fraudcasting and we're, we're going to have a bunch of content. So just because be this podcast is so hard. Yeah, just because this podcast has no more Sopranos episodes does not mean that there's no more Matt and Vince content. So please go to patreon.com slash broadcast. Subscribe now 
and um, you can still join those tiers and we'll do shout outs in the broadcast episodes and also fucking just do it because I'm about to have a baby and I have a wedding to pay for and Vince just had a baby and like this is it this is our lives now mm -hmm. man and um, you know we gotta eat our children have to eat Brent Flyberg has to eat so please patreon.com slash broadcast broadcast at gmail.com for all your questions comments and concerns vince what is the google voice number 415-275-0030 all right everybody thanks again so much for listening to all of this show and we love you and until next time don't stop believing don't stop You want that lamp? The hostess. He's smiling, she's parking, then he is among him rings. A bell rings at the hostess entrance, gets Tony's attention. The screen goes black and I hit my TV. The curtain starts to roll like this can't be true. To David Chase end his show by saying bop on goo. Keep on scrolling, names the cast and crew. The Sopranos ended with a prank, dude. I speak on the phone with my cable provider. Holding on the line behind another colors. I get a busy signal while I wait. I'm gonna murder David Chase today. I <laughs> I waited six seasons to watch Tony Soprano die. David, David, on yourself a gun. I'm not listening when you say goodbye. The Sopranos, it was bold, guess I wasn't there. To be trolled, and I wish I could get closure, just some closure. People ask what happened, David Chase. Hey, who knows? It's just a TV show now. Fuck my dick, you won't stop. You won't <laughs> give piggies their slot. Reading crackpot theories like Tony's too fucking. This is fucked up. I'm a piggy, this is shitty, so I oinked again. Yeah, I oinked again. In fact, <laughs> how do I get back there to a show about titties and got a cool show about wise guys, wops, and Jews? I hate David Chase. I want something else. I waited six seasons to watch Tony Soprano die. David, David, on yourself a gun. I'm not listening when you say goodbye. I might misunderstand the Sopranos. It could be dealing with uneasy feelings of American Empire in its death throes. Now fuck that, it's about cool guys. I'm too shallow for the snacks, I'll watch the wire, and that's a simple show about wires. And when this podcast ends, we'll take a small break in. Francesca and I will get married and take a vacation out of LA. So we are low on money. Please go to the Patreon for broadcast. I love the piggies, I must confess. Your little pink snaps, they pass the test. Daddy little bellies lap slop from the content trough. <laughs> And you hold me, and you're oinking. Still, I want to eat the piggies like the grab a cool feel myself. Turning some more slop, I'm scared. Still don't have a job. No, no, we're just join the Patreon. If you all gave us a thousand bucks a month, the dad would be all right, all right. And I wanted something else. Did Tony live or die? Baby, pod yourself a gun. We just want to say thanks and goodbye.
<laughs> so there we go. Uh, I mean, I feel like if you would have had the presence of mind to record that song and put it on the internet uh, right around when the actual finale aired, you would uh, you would have achieved like Justin Halpern levels of uh, prominence and fame by now. Yeah. But you blew it. I blew it. You know, I just uh, I think all of my creative juices at the time uh, were being spent on clever ways of getting opiates mm, yeah that's and, it's a tough one you never can tell when you're gonna start using your brain for things other than getting fucked up and being sad all the time exactly so you know you know but hey who who knows maybe one day uh one of these multitude of sopranos parody songs will just hit and everyone will in the world will be like i gotta listen to that sopranos podcast <laughs> which can one I- Figure I'll say one earnest thing, and you can take it out if you'd like uh, to. <clears throat> feel free. I love earnestness. There's the best of these songs do manage to get like some sort of real like pathos. Like I feel something while I'm listening to them, and yet I'm on a Zoom call with the man who recorded the song and who I know earlier that week was doing the Gabagool Gabagool backup vocals, <laughs> like in his home, like just uh, probably on the same mic. <laughs> and so that's yeah. a really impressive thing to me. Oh, thank you. I this is this is the very mic that I used for it, and uh, I I appreciate that. I try to, you know, man, I fucking love you, dude, and I love, I love when people love the songs, and that's why I was like, fucking, I'm gonna make the last one the best one ever. The one that uh, you did for when Adriana was killed, I don't remember what that song was, but I remember listening to it on Twitter, like, oh, yeah. and just being like. Oh wow! I think this is a good. I think he's doing a good job with this song. Thank you. Uh, that was the under pressure one. Yes. And yeah, I remember that one actually made me emotional because there was this moment where like I cut up all these like uh, parts of Adriana during like the why can't he give love, give love, yeah. give love, and like I was like, oh, yeah. I feel sad. <laughs> yeah. <now."> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I made myself sad through art, which is not something I do. On, uh, like it's... I remember. Horny. I used to make myself horny through art. Yeah, sometimes. that's more. Yeah. That's a more normal. I was way yeah. most people do it. Watching uh, uh, Better Call Saul this week, mm. and uh, and I didn't I didn't click away after the show uh, ended, so I went to the next episode, which is one of the like talking Better Call Saul episodes with oh god fucking Chris Hardwick of all people, and oh, I was wow like, still yeah, still and I was like, how does this guy still have a job? Talking about TV shows when he has done nothing for his entire career except be like, you know, kind of an obnoxious shill. Uh, but meanwhile, that's, that's us, though, dude. Yeah, but you are. Well, he, you, he owns his own home. In a just world, you <laughs> would have. Ju- I agree. You would have Chris Hardwick's career. I, I completely agree. I would have hosted Singled Out. I would have fucking done At Midnight. You, you're been totally a, right. Been a professional yeah. bowler or whatever else. I would have been a bowler. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I, all that stuff. Except for the, you know. The Sex sexual assault, yeah, yeah. was fucked up. Yeah, probably um, not that. But if you left that out, then it would be a pretty yeah. Awesome then I, I yeah. Well, anyways, we'll we'll take the rest of this on. Uh, the, you know, we'll take this to the wire podcast and finish up this Chris uh, Hardwick conversation. <laughs> podcast. <laughs>